the City of Norfolk Planning Commission. Meeting schedules and for the City Planning Commission are available online. Staff reports and maps of the City Planning Commission hearing will be available approximately one week prior to the public hearing. To access this information, log on to www.norfolk.gov slash planning. If you wish to speak on an item on today's agenda, please identify yourself when staff recognizes the item and again when the item is being considered by the commission. We normally hear the items in the order in which they are listed on the agenda. The planning department staff will introduce each item by stating the type and purpose of the application and the location of the property. A staff member will deliver a presentation on each item, followed by a recommendation on each application to be considered at this hearing. Following the staff presentation, the commission will hear from the proponents and then up from the opponents if there are any. Anyone who has called in to speak will be called by the chair. He is to state his or her name and mailing address and remarks should be limited to three minutes each. However, the applicant's time will not be limited. After all proponents and opponents have been heard, the commission will allow rebuttal, first for proponents and then opponents. Total time for rebuttals are limited to five minutes each. At the conclusion of the hearing on each item, and after considering all information presented to the commission, all the information presented, the commission will take action on the matter. Action on each matter by the commission will be to recommend approval or denial by a majority vote. The statement of the motion and the affirmative by a member of the staff is a matter of voting procedure and in no way indicates the recommendation of the staff or consensus of the commission. Following action by the commission on the matter, a written recommendation will be made to the city council. Anyone who attends the commission, anyone who attends the commission public hearing for a specific item will be notified by the city clerk's office of the date on which the city council will consider the application. However, it is the responsibility of each applicant to contact the city clerk's office to confirm the hearing date and time of the city council public hearing on the item. With that, we'll get into a roll call. Okay, we have uh, Ms. Uh, Austin. Yes, here. Okay, I don't see Mr. Houghton from Ms. Houghton G there. I, I am here. Okay, good. Uh, Mr. Murphy? Here. Ms. Shelton? Miss Shelton. No, I heard her. Yeah, she we were talking to her. She's waving. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll check those in. Uh Miss Lloyd. Here. Uh Mr. Hales. Here. And Mr. Fraley. Here. It appears we do have a quorum. We can get to our agenda. Uh, yes. Could we ask everyone to mute their their microphone if they're not speaking because we're getting a lot of feedback. Um, okay. People are talking. That's a good call, Matt. Thank you, uh, Matt. Okay. Um, before we get on to the agenda, I do have one um, matter that I uh, want to do some. Uh, it's a withdrawal, so I want to let you know about that. So before taking up the items on today's agenda. We will consider the following request for a withdrawal uh, and the following items are being um, withdrawn. So it's regular agenda item number two, the City Planning Commission for a text amendment to the Norfolk Zoning Ordinance to modify the city's short-term rental regulation. Um, as you all know, we had quite a discussion about this at the mid-month meeting. We're going to make some larger changes, so that will be wrapped up in the larger changes. So it's not that it's going away permanently, but it will be considered potentially next month um, with the uh, the larger changes. So that item will be withdrawn from this item, okay? Uh, so Susan. Again. Say again? Before you go further on that item, you have set up a proposal of a, uh, ordinance, a proposal of a correction to the zoning ordinance, excuse me. Should we disregard that as well? You're, you're breaking up a little, Earl. I'm sorry. Okay. Can you hear me better? Yeah. All right. Uh, Jeremy Sharp had sent out a draft 
uh, recommendation of the zoning ordinance revision to include short-term rentals? Should we disregard that? Yeah, I think we're still, that's still a work in progress. You, you'll okay. be getting some revised, potentially. Simple. Okay. All right, and then uh, just again, this, we, we've talked about how long the meeting was last time. Um, please feel free if at any time uh, we're into the meeting, someone needs to take a break, please let us know um, and we can accommodate that. Okay. All right. So diving into the uh, agenda. And again, the reason the, the agenda is so lengthy this month is because we've got items from uh, the April, the, uh, the March, the April, and then the current May agenda. So that's why we've got a long agenda today. So on the continued agenda, uh, the first item is the City Planning Commission for a text amendment to the Norfolk Zoning Ordinance to more clearly address parking and vehicle storage uh, pavement requirements. And this is Jeremy. Good afternoon, Commissioners. Jeremy. So this item is something we've been talking about for, for several months now, um, essentially because the current regulations are um, inconsistent, outdated, uh, hard to follow, um, they use different, a lot of different terminology across the ordinance and it's something that we do want to clear up. For example, the terms hard, paved, dust-free, improved, show up um, in different places um, throughout the ordinance taught when they speak to essentially the same thing, whether it's paved or not, they're speaking to paving materials for a, um, a parking area or a vehicle storage area. So something we wanted to clear up, um, be more consistent throughout the ordinance. So the proposed uh, amendment here would replace all those term all those terms essentially with the term paved surface, uh, and define paved surface and paved and pavement um, all as one term that essentially means concrete, asphalt, brick pavers, uh, pervious pavers that would have an allowance for things like that, um, and specifically um, prohibit gravel, dirt, um, and other loose surfaces for anywhere where a vehicle would be expected to go. So that could be a parking area, a dry aisle, that could be a, um, a vehicle storage area. It would, not prohi it would not prohibit that type of surface in an area for um, supply storage or equipment storage, um, but anything that you'd expect a vehicle to go in would be um, prohibited, would be required to have a paved surface with those um, concrete, asphalt, something similar to that. Um, so the goal here is just to, to clarify, create clear definitions, and really get to the intent. Um, I think the, the, we drafted it, and we recommend the program. Jeremy. Hello. I'm here. That's not me. Okay. I had a question, Jeremy. Um, in the current copy of the zoning ordinance that I have, the uh, chapter dealing with definition of terms is designated as 8.3.1. Uh, but yet you're referencing 8.3.2 here. And uh, my copy of the zoning orders doesn't have an 8.3.2. So what am I missing? It's possible it's a typo. Let me double check real quick. It's, um, it's 8.3.2 is terms defined. So 8.3.1 is the um, rules of measurement. Okay, good deal. So I, I don't have that chapter in my copy. Okay. Because uh, my copy of it, uh, 8.3.1 says uh, terms defined. Interesting. Which, you, may have an old, you may have an old version, Earl. I'm sure it's a draft copy. I was in on, uh, in on the ground floor there. Yes, sir. But that's fine. I, I we'll cover that later on. I just want to make sure we had... Uh, you know, just what we were doing in terms of uh, which chapter that was going to be in. It does appear to be in the right location. Okay, simple. Any other questions, commissioners? Comment or suggestion? Thank you, Jeremy. Susan? Okay. Uh, the uh, Chairman Fraley, um, excuse me, we do have um, somebody who is asking to speak on this item. Please, please get, let's have them give them their name and mailing address, please. Sure. Can you hear me? Yeah, you're fine, ma'am. Okay. This is Lisa Murphy, an attorney with Wilcox and Savage with an office at 440 Monticello Avenue, Suite 2200 uh, in the city. Um, and I just wanted to go ahead. I know we've got a later matter on this, but I wanted to go ahead and speak to this particular text amendment 
uh, because as was um, explained to you at your informal session last week, uh, my client is somewhat the reason for this text amendment. So I just wanted to talk through this. Um, our, opposition, our opposition to this text amendment is based on a couple of things. I think philosophically, you did a really good job of adopting or council adopting a zoning ordinance after months and months and months of citizen input and careful thought and consideration and public meetings, it was a fully transparent process. The, um, and as you all know, over the past two years now, you've been asked to make multiple changes, multiple text amendments. Some of them were things as small as a typo. Some of them were things that actually changed the meaning and the requirements. Um, it's our feeling, and I would say based on the, the BZA ruling on this, that this is more than just a, a cleanup of typos. This actually takes away from the director of public works, as you see on page 11 in your packet, um, the ability to make a determination as far as what type of hard surfaces would be sufficient depending on the particular situation. So. The ordinance is clear that it's up to the director of public works. Really, all of that's been stripped to make a uniform standard. And I'm not sure there's been a sufficient reason for why the standard has to be uniform and why what was adopted uh, over two years ago now is insufficient or unsuitable other than it doesn't say what I think staff thought it said. So. Uh, we would be happy to have this uh, considered after additional public comment and a public input, but I think it's a bit premature to make a text amendment, which really is going to change uh, the, the meanings of this section, and it's 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 more of a substantive change than a uh, a typo or a uh, or an editing change. And, and again, we're opposed at this time. Thank you, Ms. Murphy. We appreciate that. Uh, Jeremy, did you want to respond? I'm not really sure um, exactly how to respond to that uh, beyond that you know, we are taking this amendment to through the process. Uh, this is the public hearing or at least the first of the public hearings for it. I, I think we are following the public process for it. Um, you know, it is it is definitely a, a potential policy change. Um, I think our explanation for it, as much as anything is I don't know what the answer is currently in the ordinance as to what type of material you need to pave your parking lot or your vehicle storage area with. So the intent is to clarify that and clean it up and make it uh, clear. Why do we not accept the director of public works anymore? Is because the director of public works has not been involved. You can see the slide. So the director of public works has not been involved in these. Uh, Jeremy, I missed your comment with regard to the director of public works. Could you say that again? Sure, yeah, there was a little feedback there. So um, the reason why we're removing that is the director of public works has not been involved in these in a number of years. That's a carryover from the old zoning ordinance. Uh, it's something that we just felt as a as staff, it was it was made more sense to just have a clearer standard that you can have this material and not that material uh, rather than to um, have it be resolved through a, a process where we don't know what the answer is. The director of public works wouldn't know what the appropriate material was. Um, it was instead of a performance based there, just here you go. Here's what we want to have. Um, and so that was our proposal on this just to clarify the standard because we get these questions all the time on what can and can't be done. And it's, it, it becomes very challenging to enforce this on a day to day basis. So that was our recommendation. Um, and that's our recommendation. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, uh, Ms. Murphy, uh, very, very specifically, you're concerned that if we move forward with this particular uh, uh, zoning uh, text amendment, what problems does that create uh, in the broader world from your perspective? So um, I would be concerned with the timing for our client. I mean, obviously we've got a case that uh, is coming up, I would say under the old law and you know, there's a debate about wh which law would apply. I would also say, though, you've got a situation where you're taking all of the gravel parking lots in the city and making them legal non-conforming. And I don't know that the, the, the public would be aware of that, um, you know, just just looking at the notice that was in the in the newspaper and the description that's here. So 
Um, again, you're affecting the rights of a lot of existing gravel lot owners who are going to become legal non-conforming. And I'm not, uh, you know, I just, I don't think the notice would have been sufficient for them to realize that the use that they had is, is about to become legal non-conforming. Um, and, and also, I think the, the reason for the discretion of the uh, director of public works is because they're supposed to be looking at whether the surface that's proposed is reasonable or suitable for that particular use. I mean, you've got a range of uses from simple parking lot to automobile um, servicing type uses. And, you know, that that's a pretty wide range. You've got a use where you're working with chemicals and things that could cause a spill, and you've got a use where you're just simply parking a vehicle. So, uh, again, I, I think it's premature to make this amendment without seeking the type of input that was involved when, you know, when the zoning ordinance was adopted, especially because, like I said, I don't think anybody who has a gravel lot now, and there are many of them, especially around uh, in, in Raby and Sabre Road, where our client's located, that wouldn't be knowing, that wouldn't have any way of knowing that now their uh, their parking is going to be legal non-conforming. Thank you, ma'am. Commissioners, any comment? Uh, I, uh, it's Ramona Austin. Oh, yeah, Ms. Austin. Um, is, is there any conflict between what, um, Jeremy has just said and, uh, and what the attorney is saying? Uh, uh, my understanding from Jeremy is that what is happening today is the beginning of that public process. Am I wrong in that? Miss Austin, um, no, you're not. You're not wrong in that. The, the process for amending the zoning ordinance involves public hearings before the planning commission and then ultimately city council. So, we are following that. It also involves notification. Um, we did do the legal notification for this. Um, just to to you know answer, I think Miss Murphy's um, one of Miss Murphy's points. I think she's correct. We are potentially making some um, existing parking lots non-conforming. I would challenge that though a little bit and say that most most any gravel parking lot in this city is already non-conforming. They don't have the parking lot perimeter landscaping. They don't have the interior landscaping. They, by, by allowing this, making the surface also more non-conforming than it is today, I don't think we're really changing anything. All of those gravel lots are already non-conforming. So I don't really think we're we're affecting anybody directly by doing that um, because none of those there's not a gravel lot in the city that's going to meet the um, the other requirements of the, the of parking lots in the city um, and I think our, our overall goal here um, and, and we've talked about this for years is um, to in, improve the the resilience of the city and our feeling at staff level is that gravel parking lots um, dirt parking lots cannot um, control the stormwater effectively and if you're going to invest in your property, you should be investing in your property to create a, a paved lot that can control stormwater, can control runoff. Um, and so that, to our, to, to our uh, point of view, this amendment does, um, does move us forward in that direction. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, any other comment at this point, commissioners? Uh, uh, Chairman Fairley, this is uh, Nikita Houchins. I, I do have a question um with reference to the director of public works um I, I understand that the existing um uh, role of, of the director is it, it sounds like is to go out and, and take a look and see if, if the request that any applicant is submitting um you know if there's some need to make changes to the parking lot if it actually warrants what what they're requesting um and and jeremy from if i understand correctly that that role has not um, been taken from the director of public works for, for some years now. Is there any particular reason? Does some other staff person serve that um, in that capacity, or is that just not part of the of the process any longer? So the way the process works, it, it's twofold. If you're going through um, if you're going through full site plan review, public works, several divisions of public works will review a, a project, um, but they're typically just reviewing it up to uh, the the curb cuts, uh, the de aprons, the areas that would affect the right of way. Once it gets on the private property, they're not usually doing so. 
for an item like you would normally see uh, a conditional use permit that coming through that, that might come through this process, um, Public Works still does, the, the Public Works Division of, of Transit does review all of those items. Again, though, they're typically just looking at what impacts the right of way. So staff felt the, the idea that we're gonna have the, the Director of Public Works review parking lots in the interior area, which is not in their, their area of expertise. It's not something that they're normally reviewing. Um, it didn't feel appropriate. We felt it was better to have a, and they're not, and, and as far as I know, Public Works has not been reviewing, and they tend to shy away from reviewing those types of things. Um, so staff felt that it made more sense just to have a straight black and white um, answer, paved, not paved, and clearly define it, rather than relying on a, on a determination that we're not sure that we're gonna get. Thank you, Jeremy. Uh, if there's no further comment, Susan. Okay. The motion is to recommend approval of the text amendment to the Norfolk Zoning Ordinance. Ms. Austin. Dr. Austin. Yes, I was muted. Sorry. Yes. Yes. Um, Captains. Aye. Mr. Murphy. No. Ms. Shelton. Yes. Ms. Lloyd. Yes. Mr. Hales. Aye. Yes. And uh, Mr. Hurt. Aye. We'll make that recommendation. The council will. We won't be going to study that often. Uh, but we'll be coming back. That will be coming back to us at some time in the future. All right. So, uh, the item number two on the continued is uh, Karina Michelle Permanent Cosmetics. For a conditional use permit at 738 West 22nd Street, Suite 10, to operate a tattoo parlor. The purpose of this request is to allow for the operation of a new tattoo parlor. Um, so this site is located in the uh, 21st Street PCO. And by PCO, pedestrian commercial overlay, there's a PCO on 21st Street, and then there's also one on Collie. The focus of the PCOs are really for pedestrian uh, types of uses. Slide. So again, uh, we're in a PCO. The site is located behind Aldi's on 21st Street. It's actually in the shopping center behind that. Um, in 2019, uh, we worked with the Ghent Business Association and they said, you know, we'd like to amend the PCOs and we would like to allow tattoo parlors by conditional use permit. So this will be the first applicant coming in to request a conditional use permit um, in the 21st Street PCO. Um, staff uh, has looked uh, at the application. Uh, she has met with both the Ghent Business Association and the Ghent Neighborhood League uh, and received their approval. We feel like this is very much an appropriate use in this uh, PCO. Again, it's something that they, they, the PCO, the Ghent Business Association came to us and said, hey, look, this is, this is something a use we're interested in. They have recommended approval. Staff is recommending approval as well. Um, and I want to read, so I'm not going to read all the conditions, but I'll read some of the site-specific conditions. Um, the site shall be operated exclusively as a permanent cosmetic tattooing establishment. No general tattooing shall be permitted. And that's something the applicant has indicated to us, so we put that in as a condition. Um, there is a mistake in your staff report. The application that the applicant turned in had hours of 7 uh, o'clock a.m. till 9 o'clock p.m. Uh, the staff report does say 10 o'clock a.m. That is an error. So the correct hours would be 7 o'clock a.m. to 9 o'clock p.m. seven days a week. And no use of the facility outside of the hours of operation listed herein shall be permitted. Uh, and D, no business license shall be issued until the following conditions have been implemented fully on the site. The dumpster enclosure shall be repaired and two operating doors so that the dumpsters are fully screened. The applicant shall obtain the required licensure from the Virginia Department of Professional and Occupational Regulation Board for Barbers and Cosmetology. So with those um, conditions, staff is recommending that this application be approved. Uh, Susan. Are we requiring the applicant to enclose the dumpster enclosure area? It, it, so, it, and we've been working with her and the property owner on this. It really needs to be repaired more so than enclosed, and they have agreed to make the necessary repairs. Okay. The, the commission, is any question or comment? 
Susan, uh, let, let me be clear. That I have a note. It, this is in the 21st Street PCO, is it not? Right. Okay. All right. Uh, commissioners, any question or comment? Susan? Okay. The uh, motion is to recommend approval of the conditional use permit subject to the conditions contained in the draft ordinance, including the uh, correction to the hours of operation, moving it from seven o'clock, or from, we said 10 till seven o'clock a.m. Uh, with those changes. Um, Ms. Austin? Yes. Mr. Houchins? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Ms. Shelton? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Yes. Mr. Hales? Aye. And Mr. Fraley? Aye. Thank you, commissioners. We're on item three, Susan. Okay, item number three is sanctuary for the following conditional use permits at 2330 Bowdens Ferry Road, Building 100, A, a restaurant with extended hours of operation, and B, live entertainment. The purpose of these requests is to allow the restaurant to operate with live entertainment until 2 o'clock a.m. All right, good afternoon, everyone. So this proposal comes from Sanctuary for the property located on the southeast corner of West 25th Street and Bowdens Ferry Road in the Lamberts Point neighborhood. And the applicant is proposing to convert a building on the site uh, into a restaurant with live entertainment and late hours of operation. Next slide, please. The partial zoned conditional CC for a community commercial. Uh, the site was conditionally rezoned in 2018 to permit the development of an office building and a restaurant, uh, and it's currently under construction. Uh, the applicant is required to get a conditional use permit because they're proposing to operate past 11 p.m. and also provide live entertainment. Next slide, please. Uh, the proposed hours of operation are from 6 a.m. until 2 a.m., seven days a week. Uh, they will have 42 seats indoors with 20 bar seats and 72 seats outdoors with a total capacity of 150. Uh, for entertainment, they are proposing a live band, uh, which will not be permitted outdoors. Th this is the site plan for the proposal, uh, which was approved through major site plan uh, or through the major site plan review process in, in 2019. Um, the restaurant, or a restaurant of this size requires 10 parking sp spaces, which are located adjacent to the restaurant. Um, and on the screen, it's uh, enclosed in that red box. Um, so the development has a total of 76 parking spaces. So there's plenty of overflow parking available. Um, and it is also located on the Elizabeth River Trail. So we're going to do require a few extra bicycle parking spaces uh, to accommodate for the higher than normal bicycle travel in that area. Next uh, slide, please. <laughs> so this is the floor plan. Again, there's 42 seats with 20 bar seats indoors and then 72 seats outdoor. Um, the applicant met with the Lamberts Point Civic League uh, back in February, and they voted to unanimously, unanimously support this proposal on March 10th. Um, given the consistency with the proof plans and the improvements that will be made on site, staff is recommending that uh, this these conditional use permit requests be approved subject to the conditions in the staff report. I can stand by for questions. Hey, I uh, saw in the packet that we did get support, a lot of support from the Get Business League. Uh, but I didn't see anything from the Ginton Neighborhood League. Have they indicated any support or otherwise? This is uh, this is in the Lambert's Point neighborhood. Um, okay. So they they wouldn't have been involved, I don't think. We just got All right. information wrong. from the Lambert's Point Civic League. Okay. I'm on the wrong item. I'm sorry. <laughs> any other questions, commissioners? Uh, Susan, we know of any. Uh, so I believe uh, you do have a representative here from if you want to ask them any questions. Hi, this is Chris Udwick, uh, the developer of the property with IP Configure, a software company in uh, Sanctuary Tacos, uh, landlord, future landlord, hopefully. Thank you, sir. Give us your name and mail and address for the record, please. Uh, Chris Uterwick, uh with 
our business residing at 2330 Bowdens Ferry Road. Thank you, sir. Any further you'd like to add to the comments that Mr. Morrison has made? No, I think we're uh, excited. You know, we've got a software company that's coming here and we've left Monarch Way, which had a lot of amenities. And so we think this will be a great addition to our endeavors to bring the uh, technology uh, zone uh, with our software company. And then also this property in this building is directly adjacent to the rail yard, which right. will have similar type businesses. So we think it's complimentary and we're excited about uh, the opportunity it represents. Thank you, sir. Anyone uh, called in to speak against this application? Hearing none, Susan. Okay. The motion is to recommend approval of the conditional use permit subject to the conditions contained in the draft ordinance. Ms. Austin? Yes. Mr. Houchins? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Ms. Shelton? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Aye. Mr. Hales? Aye. And Mr. Fraley? Aye. We'll make that recommendation to council. We're on to item number four, Susan. Okay. The next item is the slow dive gallery for the following conditional uh, use permits at 117 East Princess Anne Road, A, for a restaurant with extended hours of operation, and B, for live entertainment. The purpose of these requests is to allow the restaurant to operate with live entertainment until 2 o'clock a.m. So this site is located on the south side of East Princess uh, Anne Road between Monticello and uh, Granby Street. You can see the Cedar Grove parking lot over to the east. Um, it's a fairly commercial and industrial uh, area across the street. You've got a, uh, there's Joe's Tires, but you also have a, um, a laundromat across the street. You've got a gas station further to the west. Uh, you actually have a car related use uh, butting the site directly to the west. Uh, slide. Okay, so the site is located in the G1, which is the Granby Monticello Quarter Mixed Use District. Um, and the applicant is, as I mentioned, proposing to operate a restaurant that is open until two and has live entertainment. So in the G1 district, those uses are permitted um, with a conditional use permit. So the applicant is in requesting a conditional use permit for those two uses. Slide. Um, prior to this, the the um, this uh, the site was used for the building was used for an art gallery. They also had entertainment, and I believe they also had a similar capacity. Um, it is limited because it is such a small space. So mm -hmm. the hours of operation are going to be from eight o'clock a.m. until two o'clock a.m. seven days a week, uh, limited to a total of forty nine seats or total uh, capacity. Uh, and then the typical uh, entertainment, live band, karaoke, comedian, poetry reading, and cultural dance. Uh, slide. And then here's the floor plan. As we talked about last time, the area on the right-hand side with kind of the X through it, that's actually an existing residential unit. That will not be part of the restaurant. It's really the very small part uh, to the left of that. You can see the bar seating, the restaurant, and then where the seats are. And that's really the extent of the space there. Um, staff is recommending that the uh, application be approved. And as you know, on these entertainment establishments, we do have a host of standard conditions. I won't read them all, um, but we do tie them to the hours of operation and the seating. And then because this one has entertainment, we are limiting it or we are um, requiring that the condition of use permit expire uh, in two years. So that gives the applicant two years to uh, show us that he can operate an establishment and do it clean. Uh, and then before he uh, loses his condition use permit, they come back and reapply. Um, and if there's no problems, uh, the, the condition use permit would be granted. But subject to the host of conditions, again, staff is recommending that the application be approved. Susan, the X area you described uh, in the graphic, the site plan, that mm -hmm. is, that's living space on the same floor as the restaurant. Is that correct? I believe it is. And, and it was that way with the gallery as well. And the steps I'm seeing at the bottom, that is goes to a, another living area on the second floor, I presume. 
Aren't they steps on the bottom of the? Yeah. Um, to be honest, I'm not sure what that goes to. Mm -hmm. But I, as I see, that's not ne necessarily accessed from the restaurant itself. So I see. Correct. Uh, Correct. Yeah. Correct. Mm -hmm. And we do uh, have the applicant here. Fine. Commission, any questions of uh, Susan? No. Uh, with the applicant, anything you'd like to add? Uh, no, thank you, except that we're very thankful for all your help in this process. Now, see, now that you've already spoken, you're going to have to give us your name and email address. Uh, my apologies. Uh, my name is Charles Burnell. Uh, I'm one of the owner operators of the Slow Dive Gallery and uh, at 117 East Princess Anne Road. And my residence is in the River Point neighborhood at 406 Ridgely Road um, in Norfolk, Virginia. Thank you, sir. Uh, anyone here to speak in opposition to this application? Hearing none, Susan. Okay, the motion is to recommend approval of the conditional use permit subject to the conditions contained in the draft ordinance. Ms. Austin? Yes. Mr. Houghton? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Ms. Shelton? Yes. Ms. Floyd? Aye. Mr. Hales? Aye. And Mr. Fraley? Aye. We'll make that a recommendation to council. Good luck. Okay, so next, Thank you so much. Is Brenda Flora for a condition use permit for the sale of alcoholic beverages off premise at 1231 Bazavane Avenue. The purpose of this request is to allow the restaurant to sell alcoholic beverages for off premise consumption. Uh, yes, thank you, Susan. So it's located in the Chelsea Business, business District. And in, as uh, Susan mentioned, it is a small bed and breakfast known as Brandy Flora. It also includes a restaurant. Um, next slide, please. And uh, here we see a photo of the site. It is a converted residential home that was built in the early 20th century. And as you can see, they do do a good job on upkeep. Next slide, please. It is, it is zoned uh, CN, uh, neighborhood commercial, but is surrounded by light industrial zone properties, which consists of a mix of single family homes, commercial spaces, and small warehouses. Uh, a conditional use permit was approved last year for the bed and breakfast and around the same time they were also issued a zoning certificate for the restaurant which allows for the sale of alcohol for on-site consumption provided that there is no entertainment and the restaurant closes by 11 p.m. Uh, now the owner would like to expand his business to include the sale of beer and wine for off-premise consumption which does require a conditional use permit. Uh, he is requesting to sell beer in packages less than the standard six package minimum required by the ordinance, which he is allowed to ask for. Uh, he would like to sell beer packages in four and those craft beers that uh, come in singles as, as singles. So he's asking for packages of four and for craft beer uh, singles, those that come in single packages in single packages. The hours of sales that the applicant is asking for is between you know, 5 p.m. and 11 p.m. daily. Um, and we're, staff is uh, recommending approval standard uh, with the standard conditions and um, the amended units of beer uh, packaging mentioned earlier. That concludes my report. I'm available for questions. Thank you, Joe. you get any feedback at all from the surrounding community? Uh, yes, uh, the, uh, the local, um, uh, local business district, uh, the Chesapeake Bay, I think it was the Chelsea business district is in support. Uh, yeah, they, they met with the Chelsea business association way back in November. Uh, they expressed no opposition. Thank you, Joe. Commission, is any question or comment? Uh, there is no opposition. Is anyone here to speak in opposition to this application? Hearing none, Susan. Okay, the motion is to recommend approval of the conditional use permit subject to the conditions contained in the draft ordinance. Ms. Austin? Yes. Mr. Houghtons? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Ms. Shelton? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Aye. Mr. Hales? Aye. And Mr. Fraley? <clears throat> Aye. We'll make that recommendation to council. Good luck. Uh, we're on to item number six, Susan. 
The next item is a request by the City of Norfolk to vacate the right-of-way of 4th Bay Street, south of East Ocean View Avenue and north of Three Lake Avenue. And Karan? This is uh, good afternoon, Commissioners. Um, this application is for right of vacation, and the applicant is City of Norfolk, uh, Department of Recreation, Parks, and Open Spaces. The applicant is proposing to vacate a portion of Fourth Bay Street from East Ocean View Avenue to Pretty Lake Avenue. The right of way to be vacated is located within the Bay Oaks Park. The request for the right of way vacation is made for the construction of new restroom facilities in the Bay Oaks Park. The city owns both the side of, uh, of the right of way to be vacated um, and appropriate utility easement and adjustment has been made with the, with the dominion power. The office determined uh, that the existing lane is not necessary for access and it's appropriate for vacation. So with that, we recommend approval. That concludes my report. I stand by for questions. So current, they're just eliminating that right of way to make for a unified footprint for the park. Is that correct? That's correct. Uh, are they removing the pavement and everything and just making that a grass-like area now, or does the roadway itself remain? Or oh, is that? Yeah. Oh. It's actually no roadway there. That's correct. Yes. Yeah, so, exactly um, where that road is going to go. That road is. I'm sorry, Matt. Go ahead. I think, I think they're putting a bathroom or a facility where that road where that road is currently. Yeah. Take away. Yeah, I thought that read that in the application as well. Okay. Any, yes. any other comment, commissioners? Susan. Okay. The uh, motion is to recommend approval Susan. to vacate the right of way subject to any necessary easement. Hold on a minute, Susan, if you would. Do, do we have any opposition to this at all? Go ahead, Susan. Okay. Um, so, continuing with that motion to approve subject to necessary easements, uh, Ms. Uh, Austin? Yes. Mr. Houchins? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Ms. Shelton? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Aye. Mr. Hales? Aye. And Mr. Fraley? Aye. Thank okay. you, Susan. We're on item number seven. Item is uh, a request by Heidi McCool for a conditional use permit at 6586 Tidewater Drive, Suite I and J, to operate a commercial recreation center. The purpose of this request is to allow the operation of a commercial recreation center. Hello again. So this request comes from Mr. Hadi Mahul at 6586 Tidewater Drive. The property is located in the shopping center on the southeast corner of Tidewater Drive and Legion Road, suites I and J. Uh, the applicant is proposing to operate a commercial recreation center, which is an establishment with five or more gaming devices that are provided for use by patrons. The property is zoned CC for community commercial and a CUP is required for more than four gaming machines, and the applicant is proposing 24 of the Queen of Virginia Games of Skill machines. Uh, the applicant proposes to operate from 10 a.m. until 10 p.m., seven days a week, and they will have to meet with the Mayor's Committee on Gaming prior to the City Council's final decision. Uh, when this was originally presented in January, the applicant was not required to provide additional parking because Commercial recreation centers have the same parking requirement as general retail, uh, but with the proposed changes to the parking requirements on today's agenda for commercial recreation centers, uh, the applicant would now have to provide one space for every uh, two machines, uh, meaning an additional 12 parking spaces would be required. Uh, so in total, the site has 50 parking spaces available, but using the current parking standards, all of the uses in this shopping center uh, would require a total of 81 parking spaces. So the site is pretty under park. Um, staff did receive a letter of support from the Coronado Ingle Nook Civic League on December 5th. And we also sent out notice to the Green Hill Farms Civic League on January 9th, but we did not hear back from them. Um, so based on the initial vote to prohibit these games of skill by the Virginia General Assembly earlier this year, as well as the potential negative externalities caused by um, a use like this, 
and that the applicant site does now does not meet the new parking uh, regulations, staff is recommending that this application uh, for a CUP be denied. And I can stand by for any questions. Thank you, Hi. Uh, any questions, commissioners? Comment? Uh, the applicant in attendance, would he like to make any comment at this time? If there's anyone in opposition to this application. Well, hi. Hi, everybody. Can, can you guys hear me? I hear you fine. All right, so, I mean, if we if we have to... Uh, Excuse me, sir. Excuse me. If you would give us your name and mail address. Uh, my name is Harry McCool. Um, the our uh, my mailing address is 500 Body Tort Street, uh, apartment 803 Norfolk, Virginia, uh, zip code 23510. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm applying to operate a uh, commercial uh, center, recreation center, and if there's need to like uh, reduce the uh, uh, machines, you know, the uh, number of machines, we can reduce that, you know, to meet the parking space requirements. That is the problem. But we've already uh, spent a lot of money. We've been paying rent for uh, about four or five months, uh, you know, $2,000 a month, and we spend money on uh, fixing the place and um, you know we, we, it cost us a lot of money to do uh, you know what we already done so I don't know um, I just hope that you guys you know understand you know uh, you know what we've been going through trying to you know approve this uh, this conditional use permit we understand, sir. Thank you very kindly. Appreciate you sharing your thoughts with us. Commissioners, uh, any questions of the applicant? Sir, you are you are under the current guidelines. You don't have sufficient parking areas. Are you aware of that? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, have you proposed any means whereby you could overcome the circumstance? I mean, we can reduce the, the machines in the, in the recreation center. If, if reducing the machines, you know, will fix the problem, you know, we're willing to do anything, you know, to, you know, to make it work. Understood. Commissioners, uh, any questions? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, in saying that um, he's willing to do anything to make it work, uh, is that possible at this point, given what he's being asked to correct? Well, based on what I think we just heard, I, I don't think <laughs> I, I didn't understand the God Bible. Uh, I was saying, based on what the applicant just told us and what we heard from Hank, it doesn't look like there's any latitude for him to be able to meet the requirements. That was my perception. Yes, this the site is uh is already is overparked before this was proposed. And uh and, and with my Mr. Malia is still with us, isn't there some legislation forthcoming that might impact this application, Adam? Um it, it, it might. Um uh, and it's not legislation forthcoming. It's um, legislation that's currently in effect. Um, it went through a, an alteration um, during the budget session from the General Assembly. What I'm trying to summarize is that the General Assembly had actually banned the types of machines that the applicant is proposing to uh, operate in this facility. Um, and then during the budget session, um, there was essentially a one-year reprieve put on that ban going into effect. In exchange for the one-year reprieve, there is um, there are taxes owed and a cap placed on the number of machines, but only for machines that are in facilities that have a, an ABC alcohol beverage license. Um, 
licensed. So uh, to the extent there is no alcoholic beverage license for this particular suite in this particular facility, uh, the, um, the tax requirements that were included in the budget amendment do not apply. Um, and so effectively what this operation is proposing is a type of activity that is right now scheduled to become illegal on July the 1st of 2021 uh, and would not, uh, in the meantime, would not have any obligation to pay a tax to the state, a tax to the locality, or cap a number under state law. Adam, thank you for that. Commissioners, do we have any questions or comment? Um, <clears throat> uh, Matt Hales, I, I, the only comment I have is, and I've expressed this and it's come up in the past, is that you know at, at this point in time my own personal feeling with these uh, recreation centers or gaming centers you know until we come up with a citywide plan of, of how we're going to lay these out or if we're going to allow them at all i'm not comfortable with voting for any of these or any of these and so i see where where we're headed uh citywide i'm afraid doing them one by one would would uh, end up in a lot of these facilities that we may or may not want elsewhere in the city so as you know, I've been uh, pushing the planning department to come up with a citywide plan or at least a discussion to say, do we want these at all? Until that time, I can't support this type of, this type of uh, center. Appreciate that, Matt. I think you're singing a song that I can dance to rather, rather well, uh, particularly when you add on to that, that uh, July of next year, these things are against the law anyway. And, and as Adam indicated, uh, right now, there's no uh, machine uh, uh, procedures in place to even collect taxes. So uh, I think we would be putting the applicant and ourselves in a bad way if we went against what's already been made clear to us. Uh, so that's that's my view on it. But uh, do we have anyone else, commissioners, to speak to this? Uh, yeah, Chairman Fraley, I, I'd also like to echo those sentiments of the commission with reference to um, the machines. H however, I, I, you know, I, I'm I'm really seeking a little clarity with reference to the parking situation. Um, I'm just just interested to know that, given the fact that this is a strip mall, um, and each you know there's several different suites. Um, if an operator was to lease several suites, you know what would our requirement be as far as parking is concerned? Would that be somewhat different than if each suite was was leased by a, by an, an individual operator? All right, can you re respond to that? Sure, so can, I, I'm not sure if I follow the question. Um, so when I did the analysis, I took every use in each suite and then calculated using our parking requirements um, in the zoning ordinance. So in this- What Mr. Houchins is asking is, if each one of those suites were independently operated, would that in any way, shape, or form change the parking requirement that we would place uh, on, on this particular right. um, for a commercial recreation center? Right. So the parking the parking is based on the number of machines, not the square footage. Um, so it's it's one for every two machines that are in the um, in the commercial recreation center. So fundamentally, so, so, he has. So, Ahead, so, in response to, so in response to the applicant's question about if he were to reduce the number of machines, uh, Hank, based on, on your, your analysis, if he were to reduce the number of machines, that would change his parking requirement, correct? Yes, that is correct. But the site is still, there's still thir uh, a delta of, of about 31 spaces. Now, Mr. Chairman, let me, this is Jeremy, let me just be clear, that is the proposed parking changes that we're talking about in a couple of items. So the current, the current regulations, it would not change because those are based on square footage, but the new regulations that we're proposing, it would change because that's based on number of machines. Right. And I, and I, you know, I, I really just wanted to kind of, you know, shed some light on that because, you know, obviously we have, you know, parking scenarios and restrictions that are different for different sites. Um, I, I'd hate us to see us put, you know, the owner of this pro property in a situation where his, you know, his the use is obsolete and, and un, un, you know, un, you know, usable because he's more restricted than someone else would, would have to be. Um, I, I certainly understand 
Um, this is not a site where we would want to see, you know, some recreation facility with 74 or whatever the number of machines, because that brings quite a bit of use. But we, we've we've approved applications where individuals have had zero parking spaces, and and you know, with with the um, uh, you know the uh, uh, you know uh, advancement of, of things like Uber and, and some of the share ride scenarios, then I just, again, I just wanted to, to kind of um, get some clarity on, on if, you know, how we would look at an applicant differently um, if, if the machines weren't involved. And we always, and this is Susan, so we always, in, in an instant like this, the, the property owner would not have a suite that would be rendered unusable. We would always allow retail to retail. But when you get a use that we acknowledge is much more intense than retail, that's when you have a problem. Um, mm -hmm. the you we have the potential here for a number of people coming up and staying for an extended period of time. And Mr. Chairman, if I can jump in, um, just just to you know add the last little bit of clarity. Um, we, we've been talking about number of machines. Um, technically, the, the way the regulation is proposed to be written it talks about gaming positions. So because some of these machines can have multiple players at the same time. And so it's the number of gaming positions um, that uh, would be regulated through the parking um, requirement. Okay. So thank you, George. Any other comment or question at this point, commissioners? Is anyone else here from the public to speak to this application? No, uh, this is Harry McCoy. Can I add something? Yes. Certainly, go ahead, sir. Um, I just want to say, like, you know, with, there's a lot of like these places that are already operating with no permits, you know, without permits. They're operating there everywhere. These yep. are, are everywhere. And we're trying we to. Do that. We're doing our best to take care of that. Hold on, Susan. Go ahead, sir. And then uh, we're trying to do it the right way. We're trying to. Uh, uh, work by the rules, you know, whatever is required, we're willing to do it, you know, uh, reduce the machines, whatever is required, you know, like we're trying to here, like, uh, run some business, survive, you know, uh, this this place, this business co cost us a lot of money. We had to, you know, like, like go under just because, you know, like, there are, you know, uh, some, you know, obstacles in the way. So whatever we can do and we want to do it legally we're willing to do it these machines i heard that they uh, they will be uh, they planning on uh uh collecting fees twelve hundred dollars a month for every machine uh as far as the city of norfolk you know and plus the state stack so we're willing to do whatever is required you know, to, to work, you know, and do it legally and play by the rules, you know. Um, I don't understand why, like, it's it's kind of, like, so complicated. And there's already, like, places with, like, less parking spaces that are operating uh, everywhere in Norfolk. And there's, you know, places with, like, way worse than, than the situation that we have here. And there are in operation. Uh, also, like here, not all the units are are uh, being leased. There's at least like two or three uh, vacant, you know, units here in the same shopping center that are not being used uh, right now. And some sometimes they'll be not used for years. You know, I've seen some of them not being used for years. We have a restaurant here in the shopping center. We have our customers. Our customers want these machines. Uh, you know, they like them. They go other places, but they want to come here. Uh, we have a lot of a big neighborhood behind us. A lot of a lot of our customers are going to be walking, and we have a restaurant here. A lot of our customers they walk to get their food. They don't like, you know, use uh, the parking spaces at all. So. You know, we've seen this like, you know, around us. There are, there is another place at the outside of the Wigeon Road, and they have a lot of machines. They don't have, they don't have any parking spaces. 
they weigh less than us and you know a lot of people come just walk from the neighborhood so i mean i think i think this is something doable but you guys you guys i hope that you look at it like in a more like a positive way or something i don't know how to say it but you know i think it's not it's not really you know fair that you guys don't approve this that's that's how i feel uh, after all what we you know cost us money and time and we uh applied you know we provided all the documentation that you guys you know requested we paid with fee uh everything we did everything you know right and we see we're seeing a lot of places that they're not really like doing any of that and they're they're they've been making money for months and months and months you know we've seen that all over north and everywhere but we thank you sir susan you had a comment well, I just we are aware of a lot of, of many places that are operating illegal, and we have, uh, and Jeremy could probably speak better to this with his uh, enforcement staff. We 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 are attempting to do uh, enforcement on those other locale on several other locations that we know are doing it that do not have or have not applied for the appropriate uh, conditional use permit. Thank you, Susan. Any other comment at this point, commissioners? Is there anyone else to speak for or against this application before we proceed? Hearing none, Susan. The uh, motion is to recommend approval of the uh, additional use permit subject to the conditions contained in the draft ordinance. Ms. Austin? No. Uh, Ms. Couchins? No. Okay. Mr. Murphy? No. Ms. Shelton? No. Lloyd? Nay. Mr. Uh, Hales? Nay. And Mr. Fraley? Nay. Thank you, sir. We'll make that recommendation. Good luck. We'll move on to item number eight, Susan. The next item is a request by Kali Shop for the following conditional use permits at 4800 Kali Avenue, Unit A and B, A for a convenience store, B for a commercial recreation center, C for the sm sale of smoking or vaping products. The purpose of these requests is to allow the operation of a convenience store with amusement or gaming devices and the sale of tobacco products. So this uh, site is located on the northeast corner of 48th Street in Collie, North Collie. Um, it is in a uh, newly budding commercial corridor up in North Collie. Slide. So the property is zone CC, which is community commercial, and it's a really small little shopping center. It's got three users in it. There's a, a restaurant, Mazika. There's a little uh, Boone's quality TV service. And the applicant is currently operating um, at the site now. He is actually, he has a business license to operate a retail smoke shop. Um, he was operating that prior to our current regulations that would have required a conditional use permit. However, now he would like to come in and add uh, gaming devices, that's a commercial rec center, uh, as well as a convenience store. So we would require him to come into compliance by uh, requesting the conditional use permits for all of those uses, the convenience store, the commercial recreation center, and the smell, sale of smoking or vaping products. Um, the uh, hours of operation that he is proposing are from 9 o'clock uh, a.m. till 9 o'clock p.m. Sunday through Thursday, and from 9 o'clock a.m. till 11 o'clock Friday and Saturday. Um, so uh, similar to the prior application, um, oh, and, and let me also add, um, we know he met with the Highland Park Civic League. I have followed up twice with the president and as of this morning had not received anything, um, but he did meet with the, with the Civic League. Um, as far as staff's recommendation, um, similar to the prior uh, request, um, we have concerns about these uh, facilities. As the prior applicant mentioned, there are several that have opened up without any sort of approvals, required approvals, and we are having issues with them. That's how we found out about them so quickly. So in general, we have concerns about the external issues that this type of use is creating. So. For that reason, uh, in addition to uh, there's parking issues here, not quite as substantial as the ones at the prior site, but 
if you do use the uh, proposed parking regulations, which we came up based on um, the other operations and realizing that our current parking regulations were very insufficient for this type of use. Uh, and then you put that together with, um, as of right now, these uses uh, will be prohibited uh, in July of 2021. For those reasons, staff has kind of a, a, a by uh, recommendation. So we are not supporting the uh, request for the commercial recreation center. However, we are uh, recommending approval for the convenience store and the smoking and vaping uh, products um, with the following conditions. Uh, so the hours of operation for the convenience store shall be limited to nine o'clock a.m. till nine o'clock p.m. Sunday through Thursday. Uh, there shall be no vaping products sold or used on the premises. No smoking shall be permitted within the facility and notice of this prohibition shall be conspicuously posted within the premises. Uh, a generator or other resilient power supply system shall be provided such that ice, food, gasoline, and other similar products may be uh, acquired by consumers during time of extended power outages. Um, the following improvements shall be made. The parking spaces shall be restriped. Uh, and then landscaping shall be provided as depicted on the attached landscape plan. They actually do have landscaping, but some of their landscaping um, is not doing well. So we are requiring them to replace some of the uh, landscape along uh, Collie Avenue. And then finally, and there are other conditions, but I'm, I'm, the rest of them are fairly standard. These are the ones that are specific to this site. Uh, and then the trash handling area to, to the right side of the building shall be screened with a six foot tall masonry wall. So again, um, Staff is not supporting the commercial recreation center, but with these conditions uh, would support the convenience store and the sale of smoking and vaping uh, products. Any questions? Um, is, as I recall, that place is, is about the size of a matchbox. It's Don't about 5,000 square feet, his, his location. He's got two suites. Okay. So uh, what you're but proposing- you like it is putting an awful lot in an awful small space. Yeah. Uh, but what you're proposing then would bring the smoke shop operation into conformance. Correct. And, and uh, allow for the convenience store as well. Exactly. Okay. And uh, would also uh, not approve the commercial rec center uh, based on what we just said previous to the previous uh, applicant. Is that how bad is the parking problem here? with just the so, smoke products and the convenience store. So again, under the old standard, he would be required, the, the shopping center would have been required to have 24 spaces. They have oh, 24 right. spaces. Mm -hmm. But if we use, um, and that's not grandfathering anything, that's, that's what he would have been required to have. However, again, realizing that our current uh, regulations are um, not sufficient, it would not meet the, uh, the proposed. I got you. And the same June 21, uh, July 21, did, drop dead date from the legislature applies to the uh, gaming machines as well. Correct. All right. Thank you, Susan. Commissioners, any questions of Susan? Uh, is the applicant or anyone else available to speak uh, on behalf of this application? Is anyone against this application with us? Chair, I'm glad you're here, here, Mr. Chair. This is Matt Hill. Do, do, we, do we have community support for this? So, I think you said we never got anything, Matt. Correct. Never got anything. Yeah, from I have an email from the Civic League indicating that the applicant met with the Civic League, and then I followed up twice asking for if they were going to send us anything. And as of this morning, I hadn't gotten anything. Thank you, Susan. Um, uh, we to understand, uh, Earl, it's, it's Ramona. Uh, are we are we then to understand that absent hearing back from the Civic League uh, and with the conditions that uh, the staff um, would put forward, yes to the convenience store, no to the commercial recreation center, yes to the sale of smoking, but no vaping products, those conditions would meet uh, approval uh, as far as the staff is concerned? Correct. Okay. Any other comments, commissioners? I, 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 against this application. 
this is mad again. I mean, I really would like to, I just, I can't believe that, you know, this stretch of Kali is, is they want to see a convenience store there. I really wish the, the community got back together with us on it and gave us their, either their thumbs up or thumbs down. I, I, you know, from my, from my perspective, you know, I, I'd almost rather wait a month and see if we can get the community back to, to give their, their thoughts on it. A vice, you know, okay, a convenience store because this this area is a, a is you know, potentially a nice area. They got a lot of nice restaurants, other commercial establishments coming in there. Is, is a convenience store the best use for it? I, I don't know if they're here, Matt, but I did talk to um, two uh, residents, and they were uh, they were in agreement with what our recommendation was. I don't know if they signed on. Uh, they did indicate they would be here today. So, I, you know, Matt brings up another point. You folks already know how I feel about convenience stores. Uh, but uh, think we just recently approved 7 Eleven about two blocks away. Yeah. Matt. Can I ask a question? Sure. So, the application is for the convenience store, the commercial recreation center, and the sale of smoking or vaping products, right? So, that's what we're going to vote on. I was going to break it out, but. The applicant isn't here, right? That's correct. That's correct, Kevin. I think that we should vote on the application, and if we're going to vote on revised version of it, that the applicant um, should be present, um, and that would also give us an opportunity to get feedback from the community regarding the convenience store. Okay, so you see, I think if I'm hearing you to make that happen, we're probably looking at a continuation, are we not? We well, if we vote on the application as submitted which includes all three items, the, the convenience store, the commercial recreation, and the sale of smoking vaping products. And um, in theory, if we were to not deny that or vote that down, could the applicant come back and apply for what Susan is recommending? Susan, can you respond to that? Well, uh... I'm a little uncomfortable amending applications on the fly without hearing from the applicant. Uh, that, that seems reasonable. Um, we've already continued this at least once and the applicant isn't here. I guess our better judgment prevails. Uh, if there's sufficient enough unreadiness for us to say, uh, we don't want to vote on the application as it is, or we, and we don't want to vote on the application uh, in a piecemeal fashion, we're probably better off to give the applicant an opportunity to respond and give us an opportunity to hear from the community as well. Uh, that doesn't give me any heartburn. Uh, Susan, uh, have you talked to the applicant about uh, changing the conditions? So it's not changing the conditions. So technically it's three separate conditional use permits, but we do the staff report as one. Um, yeah. and, I, so, and I actually did talk to him. I've talked to him several times within the last two days. Um, I, he, I sent him all the information. I'm not sure why he's not here. Um, so, and he, so, so, he is aware of what our recommendation was going to be. Okay, so he's aware that he's getting, uh, he's got three CUPs before us, and uh, you're going to recommend in favor of one and against uh, the third. Uh, in favor of two and against one, correct. Yeah, so, uh, and he, and you're confident that he's aware of that? And, and yes, he's absolutely aware of that. Kevin, that give you some uh, uh, better pause then? Um, I'm comfortable voting on it. Okay. Many favors. I agree for me. Um, and so what are we suggesting then another continuance on this? Because maybe he had technical difficulties. I don't know, but to not be present, uh, is a problem. I I'm comfortable taking action on what he applied for um, as long as it doesn't exclude him from um, what staff is recommending. So, so Kevin, you want the applicant to have the opportunity to come back to us. Uh, it seems to me that we should be taking action on what was applied for. Okay. okay. My question is, does that then prevent us from um, 
potentially doing what Susan recommends. I think what Susan says, we're going to take three votes. So oh, we're taking three votes. We're going to take three votes. So that you can, you can take yeah. just the one or all, none or just all. So it's going to be three votes. Okay. You happy with that, Matt? I'm sorry, Matt. Uh, Kevin? I understand it. Three, three CUPs. If you're not happy, but you understand, that's important, right? I, can I ask one quick question to take uh, if he if if this gets voted down, he can continue to oper operate the smoke shop. Is that correct? It, not if that's denied. OK, so now that he's applied, he has to be brought into compliance or he can't operate it. Correct. All right. OK, that's, all right. that's all right. but, uh, clarification. He can operate it, but with no vaping products, he can sell smoking for products like tobacco and whatnot, but he cannot sell vaping products, correct? Correct. No, if you, I mean, if you deny the initial use permit for the sale of smoking or vaping products, then he's, he has nothing. This is Derek Donham. I was having technical difficulties. Ah, there we go. There we go. That's the applicant. Uh, I, 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 <laughs> I apologize. This is uh, Derek Donham. I live at 1401 Waterlawn Avenue, Chesapeake, Virginia. Uh, I was trying to communicate to you, but I had to recall in a couple times for it to actually connect. Okay, so the floor is yours. Okay. Um, I, I heard a whole lot of information. Um, so, yeah, I've been a victim of circumstance myself uh, due to corona and different things going on. It's hurt me and rent as well. Um, so what's operating there right now is basically already a convenience store. Um, I was trying to add the uh, recreational products, which um, Susan already informed me that that wasn't going to be passed through. So I'm trying to do the uh, additional sale of smoking products. Well, just, just to clarify, the business license that he got was only for retail smoking products. If he were to have applied for a convenience store conditional use permit, he would have to have put in a generator, which that's not what he applied for. So that is not what he has. The only thing that he's approved to do right now there is retail smoking product, which is our smoking and vaping product. Okay. I, I was under the impression that it was actually covered under a uh, convenience store. Uh, that's what we have right you know now other than drinks and things of that nature but yeah i would like to add uh the convenience store type stuff to the uh sales of the smoking products and add that to it if we're not able to go through with uh their recreational seminar i did hear you on the previous one about that um i did i was going to request bringing the machines because i had requested 24 machines uh six months ago or in january when we first did this i was going to request if we could bring it down to eight machines since the parking was available um but if that's you know the, susan explained to me that that's not something that was going to be supported um but we were willing to go through with the other stuff so that's that's where i'm at right now okay i'm i'm totally confused on where you are right now and where we are right now so <laughs> Uh, uh, if I'm understanding, if I think I'm understanding what you're saying, sir, I think what we're looking at is is a continuation of this because you want to apply for a convenience store separately. Am I understanding that? No, he's uh, applying no, for a convenience store. I, I apologize. So that those are his three conditional use permit requests: convenience oh. store, commercial recreation center, sale of smoking or vaping. He's he he is currently right now. Uh, he has a business license to do uh, retail smoking. So he is technically grandfathered for that because he applied for that and got that license before we required a conditional use permit for it. Yeah. Uh -huh. But now that he wants to add the convenience store, and the commercial rec center, the gaming, everything has to come into compliance. So he's asking for three different conditional use permits. Mm -hmm. Correct. What she said. She's much better than me at this. <laughs> what is what is the position? However, yeah. I mean, our our position has been on the uh, smoking and vaping product. Uh, smoking, yes, but there is an issue with vaping products. Is there not? Yes, right. I don't want to carry vaping products. Oh, sorry. 
you don't want to carry vaping products. That, that's correct. I'm not applying to carry vaping products. Okay. Oh, yes. I understand. Okay. Susan, how long has the applicant been, been operating prior to completing an application to come into compliance? So I think he got his business license for the smoking shop in January of 2019. Yeah. In January of 2019? Correct. That's what our um, business license records, I believe, showed. Have there been any complaints or anything from the community? Not that I'm aware of. Thank you. The applicant, Susan, is applying for the products. He is. Is that true? No, and it's condition uh, B, or excuse me, C, says there shall be no vaping products sold. So it's really just for the smoking, which is kind of what he's doing now. Okay, good deal. Good deal. Any other comment at this point? Anyone here against this application? Comments, commissioners? Uh, yeah. Uh, on the commercial recreation center, um, how does it? How does this application conform with what we've done previously? When we, when you say done previously, do you mean yeah, as far because as we, because according to Adams, uh, what he has informed us about the disposition of uh, of machines uh, and whatnot for this use, um, where what what where does our position where where what's the technicality for us on this particular application? for the Commercial Recreation Center. Well, the this same is where it gets apply. confusing for me. The same rule would apply. There, there is legislation that goes in effect July of 20, uh, 2021 that would outlaw these types of gaming machines. That, that was, uh, that's where we are with the gaming machines. Uh, it only be outlawed July of 2021. So this applicant wants to put this in but it's going to be outlawed uh in a, in a year and some month with regard to the gaming machines it's the same thing as we had with the previous applicant yes okay any further comment question criticism suggestion i, I just want a point of clarity here um uh, susan you're going to break this up into three parts one part of which the applicant has been operating for over a year now and has had no complaints and is, is, is seeking to come into compliance. Is that correct? I'm going to read them as three different motions for each of the different conditional use permits. To answer your question, I think well, Nikita, yes, he has been working at a smoke shop since January of 19. Or operating a smoke shop since January of 19. Well, well, it sounds to me like he's operating as a convenience store, but did not know that he didn't have have a, a use permit to be a convenience store. That that's that's what I thought I heard, but I yeah, could he, be wrong. I think I'm you're sorry. Right. <laughs> okay, I am right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. The the question then does that mean he's offering other than smoking products? Well, I think he's told us that he's just doing smoking products. There's no vape. There will be no vape. Yeah, but I think so. And, and to the to, I think what we're saying is he. I think he thought he got approved for convenience store, so he may be acting as a convenience store, but that's not what he was approved as. Okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, a convenience store that is just selling smoking products, because the only thing when you say convenience store, I think about a number of things and. Uh, I did hear him say that he thought he had that and therefore he was selling uh, smoking products, not vaping products, smoking products. My question was, is he selling anything else besides uh, smoking products? I think he is, but he can address that. Uh, yeah, the, I have been selling uh, telecommunications out of the location but the location was only open for about a week's time, uh, being that I came in in January 
and I was waiting for the special permits to come through. So it, it hasn't been operating the entire time due to the coronavirus and things of that nature. Um, so I've only sold uh, vape, uh, excuse me, smoking products and telecommunication products out of the location. What but are you? Like what do you mean? Drinks and things of that nature. What do you mean by telecommunication products? Um, accessories for cell phones, things of that nature. Okay. Any further comment? Anyone other than the applicant to speak for this towards this application for or against? Hearing none. Susan. Okay. Hello. Me first. Can I be heard? Oh. Yes. Uh, my name is Susan Quaid. I've, I've been on the call, but I haven't been able to speak. Um, I'm with 4807 Collie Avenue, and my sister Wendy Lance is on this call as well. Um, we just wanted to weigh in a little bit on the staff recommendations, which we mostly agree with. We have sent a letter expressing our concerns. Um, I don't know how familiar people are with this property. We're in a small office building directly across the street. It's a one story. We have about, you know, capacity for 10 tenants, no parking. We only park on the street. As you face this to the right is the bank, they have parking. And on the left is residential with limited parking. And we're very concerned that this will be a terrible hardship for us as far as parking um, and the impact it's going to have on parking on the street. Uh, convenience store is one thing. There is some parking there, but gaming is a whole other ball game, as, as it were. I don't know exactly if this is going to be a convenience store or a vaping store, but I think the consequences for residents on this, for people on the street need to be taken into consideration. I will also tell you, we have been emailing uh, David Barley in regards to this for some time now and calling David, haven't been able to get through. And I'm not sure that the Highlands Civic League isn't in the same position where maybe they think they've been heard, but have been emailing and trying to contact the wrong person. Uh, I've emailed, um... The president uh, a couple times trying to let him know that we haven't gotten anything, Mr. Ryder. Right. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I apologize. I, I spoke to Mr. Dale Ryder. I, I was told that they were going to send in a a letter of um, recommendation for the site, but I haven't seen any letter come to me, or and I haven't been able to get in touch with them either. But I did meet with the Civic League three times, three separate times. Thank you, sir. Are uh, there any other comments with regard to this application for or against? Susan, can I ask a question real quick? What are the current operating hours? I wrote down what the proposed ones are, but what's the current operating hours? Uh, 9 a.m. to 9 p.m. Same. Okay. Susan? Okay, so three different motions. The uh, motion is to recommend approval of the conditional use permit for a convenience store. Ms. Austin. Uh, yes. Mr. Houchins. Aye. Mr. Murphy. No. Ms. Shelton. Yes. Ms. Lloyd. Aye. Was that a no? Ms. Lloyd? Aye. 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 Mr. Hales. No. And Mr. Fraley. No. Okay. All right. The next uh, motion. Oh, is Susan, for the record, the recommendation is uh, to approve by a four to three. Uh, is that what you have? Recommend, yeah, I'm sorry, Adam. The recommendation is to approve four to three. I'm sorry. Okay. Uh, the motion is to recommend approval of the conditional use permit for a commercial recreation center. Ms. Austin. No. Mr. Houchins. Nay. Mr. Murphy. No. Ms. Shelton. No. Ms. Lloyd. Nay. Mr. Hales. No. And Mr. Fraley. No. 
Unlikely. I'm sorry, that motion is denied uh, unanimously. The motion is to recommend approval of the conditional use permit for the sale of smoking or vaping products. Ms. Austin. Uh, um, I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm confused on the vote. If it's for the sale of smoking only, I will say yes. So the name of the use in the zoning ordinance is smoking and vaping. So that's what we have to call it. There is a condition that says he will not sell vaping products, but I have to call it by what the zoning ordinance calls it. I am I understand. And, and it's and, called smoking and, or vaping. So it could just be one of the two, which is the case here. Right. That's fine. I'll say yes. Uh, Mr. Hutchins? Aye. Mr. Murphy? No. Ms. Shelton? No. Ms. Lloyd? Nay. Mr. Hales? No. And Mr. Fraley? No. Uh, we'll make that recommend that that motion is denied and we'll make that recommendation to council. We're moving on to our regular agenda. I have number. Before we get into agenda. that, Susan, do we want to hey, take uh, a break? Uh, we want okay, to continue. Break. How long? Break time, I was uh, five minutes. Is that too long or too short? I'm going to do 410. I think that's, I think that works for me, Susan. 410 okay. commissions. Breaking the 410. Thank you.
back with us, first of all. Mr. Hales? Yes, sir, I'm here. Thank you. All right. Mr. Houchins? Amanda? Kathy? I'm here. Oh, Amanda just popped in. Okay. Yeah. Right now we got four or five. Well, we do have a quorum. Dr. House is with us. I'm here. Okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Lloyd, you with us? We got six out of seven. I think we safe to proceed. Okay. Uh, on to the regular agenda, Susan. Okay. The first item on the regular agenda is a request by the City Planning Commission for a text amendment to the Norfolk Zoning Ordinance to modify minimum, minimum parking requirements for the commercial recreation centers. All right, so we've danced around this one a, a, a little bit here and there, so I'll be quick. Um, so our current regulations treat uh, commercial recreation centers for in terms of parking. Uh, they treat them uh, on a one space per a certain amount of square footage um, requirement. That's a very common way of doing things. Um, these types of uses have been around forever, um, it, but typically they've been pool tables, um, <laughs> pinball machines, big video video machines, uh, you know, think of the 80s arcade or, or earlier than that. So um, the, the, the square footage made a lot of sense. What we're seeing now, though, is not just these games of skill machines. It's also console games. Um, it's people plugging an Xbox in where eight, play, where eight people can play it together. An Xbox takes up just about nothing. So um, it is it is definitely a changing world when it comes to these things. So um, we have crafted a amendment here to um, regulate these machines um, or devices by gaming positions, as George had mentioned earlier. So um, essentially a pool table might get you four gaming positions because four people can play it. Um, a, a, a video game machine, if you've got um, set up for eight controllers, it would be eight people. Um, and so you'd have to provide parking spaces um, multiplied by the gaming positions rather than by square footage. That's the proposal that we're, we're putting in place right now. We think it just makes a lot more sense to really uh, meet the new technology needs. Um, staff does recommend approval. Thank you, Jeremy. Any questions of Jeremy commissioners? Anyone here to speak for or against this particular application? Hearing none, Susan. Okay. The motion is to recommend, recommend approval of the text amendment to the Norfolk Zoning Ordinance. Ms. Austin? Yes. Mr. Houchins? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Ms. Shelton? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Aye. Mr. Hales? Aye. And Mr. Fraley? Aye. We look forward to that, Jeremy. Thank you. Uh, okay. Item number two has been withdrawn. We only three, Susan? Yep, yep, number three, uh, City of Norfolk for the following amendments to the future land use map within the city's general plan, Land Norfolk 2030. A, from industrial and utility transportation to residential mixed at 1200 Gough Street, 1351 and 1371 Hanson Avenue, 1401 and 1445 Maltby Avenue, 1416 Cary Avenue, and 1525 and 1535 St. Julian Avenue. B, from residential mixed to institutional at 2700 East Princess Anne Road, 2737 and 2739 East Princess Anne Road, Southside East Princess Anne Road, G pin 143798 Northside Hollister Avenue, G pin 143798 Southside East Princess Anne Road, G pin 143798 Southside East Princess Anne Road, G pin 1437889671, 1209 and 1215 Norchester Avenue, 2738 and 2744 Hollister Avenue, G pin 1437985750. And I'm going to read the next one because it's going to be um, both a part of the same presentation, but I will do separate um, motions at the end. So also city of Norfolk for the change uh, for the following change of zoning from IG industrial general and IL industrial light to MFNS multifamily neighborhood scale at 1200 Gough Street 
1351 and 1371 Hanson Avenue, 1401 and 1445 Maltby Avenue, 1416 Cary Avenue, and 1525 and 1535 St. Julian Avenue, and 1445 Roberts Road, B from IL Industrial Light and PDBCR Plan Development Broad Creek Renaissance District to IN Institutional at 2700 East Princess Anne Road, C from CC Community Commercial and SFT Single Family Traditional to OSP Open Space Preservation at 2707, 2711, 2727, 2729, 2737, and 2739 East Princess Anne Road, Southside East Princess Anne Road, GPIN 143798-5904, and Northside Hollister Avenue, GPIN 143798-2. 659 and Southside East Princess Anne Road, GPIN 143798 1626. Southside East Princess Anne Road, GPIN 143788 9671. 1209 and 1215 Northchester Avenue, 2738 and 2744 Hollister Avenue, and Northside Hollister Avenue, GPIN 143798 5750. Chris. Thank you, Susan. Uh, good afternoon, commissioners. Um, as you can see, lots of properties involved in this one. Um, it is two part, uh, really two pronged uh, application in front of us here. It's um, a set of general plan amendments and a set of rezonings. And it's all part of what we call the Broad Creek refresh, uh, which is a uh, planning process that has been going on for some time now, um, just, just early this year. It, uh, we started to get underway with that. And this is phase one of that refresh effort. So um, on the slide in front of you, you can see the study area for the refresh. Uh, what we're looking at as far as the study area for this is essentially everything within the Broad Creek area uh, north of Corker Avenue and everything, what, uh, excuse me, east of the Norfolk Southern Railroad tracks, uh, just east of Tidewater Drive, uh, everything on also west of the tide, or excuse me, the Norfolk Southern uh, Railroad tracks uh, there to the east. And then everything to the north you see there is bounded essentially by the railroad tracks as well as St. Julian Avenue and St. South Cape Henry Avenue. Um, so the neighborhoods we're looking at include Bruce's Park, uh, Central Brambleton. Uh, we have Spartan Village, um, part of Ballantyne Place as well. Uh, and we're looking at you know different different uh, landmarks as well, like many schools in this area, um, as well as um, a collection of single family and multifamily. Um, so uh, this that's the that's the study area we're looking at for the whole Broad Creek refresh. Next slide, please. And as uh, as as the kind of the first part of this effort is looking at what, what was done in the past as far as planning efforts go. And the first plan was 2004 for the Broad Creek Revitalization and Implementation Plan. So that was the first area plan really for the area. And this is intended to be a refresh of that plan to see if we're on the, on the same track or the right track uh, moving forward. Because a lot of things have really uh, have changed in the area significantly uh, just since 2004. Um, so back then, the, the plan highlights were really to preserve the traditional uh, neighborhood that context that has been there for a long time, uh, strong urban context, the way that the neighborhoods are laid out, the historic character of those homes, um, especially in in the Broad Creek area, formerly known as Haynes Track, um, and just you know try, just maintaining what's what's good there uh, as far as the development patterns go. Um, connection, leveraging and emphasizing connection to arts and cultural facilities, academia, uh, and, and technology improvements. Uh, that was a big thing that came out as well. Um, also leveraging their access to the waterfront and the downtown Norfolk core. So it, it's a very strategically uh, located area. It's, it's a near a lot of, of, of uh, facilities and amenities that the city has. Um, and it has good transportation access uh, with inter the interstate system and light rail. Uh, which, which came much uh, later after this plan. So the issue or the, the real kind of focus was let's let's make Broad Creek a, a model for revitalization around the country and build on those, those current efforts. Next slide, please. And so then the next really big planning update that we had done it was plan over 2030 uh, in 2013, the, the city's comprehensive plan. 
Um, and what that did across the city was put a lot of these area plans, the actions from the area plans uh, and recommendations in all into this new comprehensive plan and to, to really better organize where we've been. And for Broad Creek, it was no different. Um, they, you can see here this list of uh, recommended actions uh, were really stemmed from that 2004 plan. So this was the first time they were really codified uh, into the, the comprehensive plan for the city. Um, and, and as you can see, just looking at the list here, a lot of this stuff's already been done. Uh, new library, the G Jordan Newby Library is, is, is currently there. Uh, we have the revitalization of Granny Village has, has taken place and continued. Um, Moton Circle, an area of redevelopment as well. Uh, the Croc Center is there. Uh, we have, uh, and also there's uh, a park, the Broad Creek Triangle Park as well, which is part of this part of this application too. So a lot of things have happened, not only planning wise, but on the ground too. Uh, next slide, please. And then the third, the last thing that really happened was Vision 2100. That that's the most recent planning effort that really touched Broad Creek um, and what what the plan was essentially other than being kind of a way of, of of planning future growth whether it's economic population infrastructure um and also resilience focused you know planning for, for future sea level rise and flooding it, uh issues in, in certain areas uh categorizing each of the areas of the city in in one of these colors and for broad creek it was in the purple area so the purple area was they were called neighborhoods of the future and as you can see right there on the page, it was actually the Broad Creek Renaissance development was used as a photo on the, on the cover. So um, very much Broad Creek in mind with this plan. Uh, much of the same, improving connections to the city's assets, prioritizing infrastructure investments in the neighborhoods, uh, maintaining housing affordability while also improving the economic value of the area. Um, and again, trying to focus on these kind of underperforming multifamily and commercial areas in these neighborhoods. And, and promoting, again, the stability of the historic character. Next slide, please. So, as I mentioned, th and this is a list of things that have happened on the ground, a really big success story there in Broad Creek. Yeah, this is uh, one of, if not the most, I think, su successful uh, in, in examples, really, of, of planning processes that happened and, and things that actually were developed on the ground that were in keeping with those planning processes. Um, so you can see see all that there, and, and you, I'm sure you're very familiar with most of them. Next slide, please. And so, as I mentioned, this is phase one of the uh, two-phase Broad Creek Refresh Plan. Um, phase one uh, is going to be, you know, we split it out this way um, because we feel that these, these changes in front of you are warranted uh, through uh, the, the plans that I mentioned in the past, uh, community feedback throughout those plans, um, and just the state of current affairs. Um, that there's enough there to, to go ahead and, and go forward with this package of, of amendments. Um, and then in the meantime, and, and going forward, phase two will be a robust public participatory process, um, which could identify some more issues that we, we then go back and you know, refine some of the phase one work. Um, but phase two is gonna be the, the, the big public outreach efforts um, as far as the survey goes, online survey, it's out there. Uh, we have a website, uh, just continuing to get feedback. We're gonna you know, go out into the community, try to get some feedback in different areas virtually. Um, so phase one, you know, to, to go, to give you just some brief history, in August of last year, the Planning Commission initiated a general plan amendment to basically begin looking at the Broad Creek area. And, and that's, that's really why we're here with the general plan amendments. Um, and then in April of this year, city council initiated the rezonings that you see in front of you. So again, the, the current zoning in the area doesn't really reflect a lot of the current uses and conditions, and, and that's really necessitating this phase one work. Uh, so next slide, please. So uh, the, the future land use map amendments here are broken down into three, just like the rezonings you'll see. And I won't hit read, I'll spare you the, uh, the addresses again, uh, but I'll, just break them into pieces here. The first one is industrial and utility and transportation as a future land use designation to residential mixed. And this would be properties in the Bruce's Park neighborhood. Um, and you'll see on the next map, I'll show you uh, in a little bit more context where that is. Um, and that is necessitated through the planning efforts that have happened in the past. Um, and really the kind of the state of the neighborhood right now and, and the road network there 
um, it, it just is not conducive to uh, modern industrial use. Uh, a lot of the heavier industrial uses um, that maybe that have, have existed in the past and, and, and may have thrived at, at one point in time. Um, so that's the first one. And the second is residential mixed, uh, which is a current designation where the Jordan Newberry, Newby Library is and the uh, Broad Creek, the Richard Bowling Elementary School uh, to institutional. So that would just reflect what's there. Uh, institutional uses might as well change the future land use map amendment or the map to, to uh, reflect what's there for hopefully a very long time. And then single family traditional to open space recreation where the Broad Creek Triangle Park is that I mentioned. Um, that same thing, something that's happening on the ground and it will be there for a long time. So this is the map that shows you exactly where they are again. And uh, top left is, is the Bruce's Park neighborhood where the industrial is going to, would go to residential mix, which would match um, where you see in the pink there, that's all residential mix. So it kind of bring that Broad Creek Renaissance area, that same that future land use designation over to that uh, formerly industrial site. Um, and then again, the middle sections being uh, the Broad Creek Triangle Park to the south and to the north where the library is. Next slide, please. And then the rezonings are exactly the same areas. Um, we're looking at um, the, the the Bruce's Park areas. They're zoned industrial, indu light industrial, and general industrial. Set sending or t uh, changing that to multifamily neighborhood scale. And the reason for that is the rest of the Bruce's Park neighborhood is currently zoned multifamily neighborhood scale. Um, so we would just be matching what is already there um, for for the for the uh, time being at least. Um, so going to match what's there in, in the neighborhood, um, allowing for a multitude of residential uses, including single family um, and industrial light and plan development, Broad Creek Renaissance is what's currently zoned at the uh, library and elementary school site there. Um, so that that's just split zoned and we'd like to correct that to institutional to reflect what's actually there. And same goes for the Broad Creek Triangle Park. It's zoned commercial and single family. Let's bring it to open space preservation. To really preserve that open space use. Next slide, please. And that's that's the map again. Same properties, just showing what the zoning districts are. Next slide, please. So that that uh, that sums up the the uh, broad the phase one of Broad Creek Refresh is what we're looking at here uh, with with these two sets of applications, the plan amendments, the general plan amendments, as well as the rezonings. Um, and staff, uh, we just feel that there is, uh, we're going forward with phase one at this point um, because there's enough, um, there is there is plenty of, uh, you know, the, um, work that's been done in the past, planning uh, by the city, NRHA, and the communities there, uh, lots of strong neighborhoods there and civic leagues that have been involved. And, and this, these amendments are, what we see is kind of reflecting that work that's been done and, and that there's there's enough there through throughout the plans and the feedback. Um, and so staff recommends approval of all of the applications, the future land use map amendment, amendments and the rezonings. Um, I'll also just briefly mention we had a meeting on April 30th, a virtual community meeting, the our first one, uh, where we had a, a good amount of attendees, up, upwards of 50, um, where we described this whole effort and these applications as well. Um, and there's, uh, I'm, I'm, I think there are a, a few people on, on the call that, are, that were there as well. So hopefully uh, we'll, we'll get continue to get some good feedback um, and I'll stand by for questions. What kind of feedback did you get at the meeting, Chris? So uh, the meeting, the main feedback was, um, well, there were a few questions about the industrial to the east. Uh, that's, that is within the study area, um, just above Virginia Beach Boulevard, that area uh, in Princess Anne Road too. Um, whether that was a part of it and, and yes it absolutely is part of it um you know it, even though the phase one isn't dealing with that right now but the, the efforts of phase two and the overall broad creek refresh uh certainly that is within the study area and we'll uh, take a look at that as well um, another thing was was just making sure that bruce's park was a was a part indeed a part of the plan which absolutely it, it is it's actually a huge part of the plan uh as you can see in the phase one applications in front of you um, that's one of the biggest issues to address or areas of the study area to address. Um, and another thing was uh, regarding versus park, there was a concern about, uh, so going to multifamily neighborhood scale as a zoning district 
Um, you know, th there's some concern over there by the residents that uh, with the, the multifamily buildings, the actual structures, the uses there, um, and, and the, a preference for it to actually be go to single family. Um, so our, and our response just at this point is just that um, it's simply going to multifamily neighborhood scale right now um, if, if these rezonings are approved because uh, that is what the rest of the neighborhood is zoned right now. So it would just be a continuity uh, piece, if anything. And in a single, a rezoning is something different other than multifamily neighborhood scale would require more a robust uh, lot pattern analysis and other rezoning analysis analyses that we uh, we just uh, we can do for as part of phase two, uh, I would say. But at this point, um, as, as our phase one efforts go, uh, that was that's really the rationale as to why we're going to multifamily neighborhood scale. Chris, so fundamentally with these two applications, fundamentally all you're doing is all you're doing. I don't mean for it to sound that simplistic, but uh, you're just updating the land use future land use map and applying the zoning to that updating. Is that correct? Uh, yes, sir. In a, in uh, I would say overall that's that's the main sort of the crux of it, and um, we. Yeah, we, we noticed there were a few things, um, you know, there were a few slight variations as far as the 2004 plan went and, and the location of facilities like the library and uh, the school, you know, it, it had it originally located a little further to the east, but um, so that may have been why some of the designations, future land use wise and zoning weren't, weren't quite reflective of what ended up going there. So yeah, th in a sense, this a big part of this is just correcting and, and what's there, reflecting what's there um and sort of protecting those uses in the future um that's that's a huge part of it but i will definitely uh say that the bruce's park efforts are just as equally if not more a part of this um as you see on the northwestern part of the study area thanks chris commissioners any questions of mr whitney uh yeah chris i uh nikita here i got a couple questions for you um great great work very detailed is it uh exciting to see um, this part of the city um, getting some attention and uh, looks like that we, we we should have some some uh, some some you know residential coming around in some areas that have been pretty much underserved over the years um, my question in your analysis do, do you take a look at um, the effects that the increase in residential um, both both multi uh, family and, and single family would would have on some of the public? services such as the schools and the roads and um things of that nature um yeah yeah we um you know we do have like an ongoing uh just as, as a part of the planning department we have a, a list of you know multifamily projects large larger projects that yes that have impacts on the school system and other and other, and other things um and that certainly would would be part of that like for example the um the new apartments over on the, at the very uh, western part of the study area um, above uh, Booker T. Washington High School uh, by, by SL Nussbaum were, were part, you know, an example of, of multifamily that's going in that, that we make sure to sort of capture in, in our future projections and uh, in impacts, like you say, on city services. Um, so we will, yeah, that, that's definitely something that we will take an even broader look at or a closer look at uh, in phase two, I would say. Yeah, I'd be really interested to see, um, you know, if, if things go well, you know, what, what, you know, what it looks, you know, what, what it would look like as far as the capacity of the schools. I know, um, it, you know, the high school students in, in much of Broad Creek go to uh, Lake Taylor and there have been some talks of, of, you know, maybe Lake Taylor going away. I don't know, you know, what that looks like now, um, but um, I'd just be interested to know if, 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 you know, a lot more families move to this area, you know, where would they, you know, where would they be going to school? Um, you know, what kind of retail grocery stores and things of that nature would be coming to the area. So um, if, if that's part of, of what your study and your analysis would, would present, then that could be some really good information. Um, and the last question I had, um, have they, have they looked at traffic, you know, slowing traffic down at all um, and, and um, coming eastbound? Um, down Princess Anne as, as you, you know, get closer to Military Highway. Um, is that part of your study as well? Um, we, so we, we actually do, uh, we are, we're fortunate to be working with the Transit Department on um, 
there's a Princess Sand Road corridor project that's that's underway right now. Actually, has has been for a little while. Um, and the transit department uh, has been very much, you know, has been leading the charge with that. And as far as like different improvements to Princess Sand Road, um, it's focused. A lot of it's focused, I would say, you know, but in front of the the school site and the uh, Triangle Park, and then just you know going a little bit uh, west of that and east of that. Uh, kind of in that core of Princess Anne Road, um, but that so that's I would say that is the um, you know the major Princess Anne Road as far as traffic and safety goes uh, right now and speeding goes, and we continue to um, we, you know even though we're not managing that process we we've been working really closely with transit and actually uh, have links to that project on our website and we we want to make sure that we're in close contact with them as we move forward. Um, in the survey that we have out there as well, there's a question there. You know, it deals a little bit with with traffic and safety as far as you know, is that a concern or a weakness of, of the Broad Creek study area? Um, so, you know, I don't have a whole lot of details uh, at this point on on that specifically, but but I will definitely say that we are working very closely with transit and and really expect to have uh, as part of the plan when it's finished recommendations uh, for Princess Anne Road. Do you, do you know if there's a, a traffic light that will still be um, installed in front of the park? Um, in front of the library? Uh, try, I, I, oh, the park. My, to my recollection, when the uh, Triangle Park came before us, um, they were uh, planning on installing um, a traffic light to, to kind of slow traffic down, for, uh, you know, to, to help kids that were coming from the school and going to the park and, and back and forth. Do you, do you know if that's still part of the plan? Um, I believe, you know, I'm looking, actually looking at their uh, project information right now. And I think looks like, so they're upgrading the signal at Princess Anne Road and Majestic Avenue, um, doing some coordination and, and gathering input with residents uh, on how to just how to utilize Princess Anne Road and, and locations they have issues at um and they're doing some kind of some citizen information meetings um to present some of these designs um it looks like so the actual project is between church street and valentine boulevard so it really does cover this entire uh the stretch that we're looking at in our study area um you know other than that um i'm kind of looking at some of the uh some of their project slides and and i believe I, you know, I do not, I look, it looks like they're doing some pedestrian safety improvements. A lot of it's crosswalk markings, high visibility crosswalk markings, um, some curb extensions and bulb outs, um, improved lighting. That's a, that's a big part as well. I know that they mentioned that as well in our April 30th meeting. Um, and yeah, but I, I think, you know, I'd probably, you know, I'd have to look or work really with our transit staff a little bit more to get some other detailed proposals, um, but I can, you know, I can certainly look into that some more uh, and get back with you if that's okay. Hey, well, I just, I would just give you a heads up to keep an eye on it. You'd hate to have the scenario of what, you know, we have there on Campus Stella Road with the school on one side and residents on the other. Um, you know, history has shown us that, you know, it, it doesn't fare well for a four lane, um, you know, traffic going back and forth through, through a development like that. But uh, I just, just thought I'd inquire if that was still something that was going on. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's and all I got. Like, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Houchins. That's it. That's all I got. Uh, Chris, I'd like to get on the back of that horse with Mr. Houchins. Uh, you know, that's the tricky intersection where the Triangle Park is. Uh, you got uh, you got a five way street coming together right there, uh, which and right across the street from an elementary school and library. Uh, you know, it might be critical as you go through the process of dealing with the traffic control people. I haven't taken a real critical look at that. Uh, I, I do recall we're asking for um, more than just adequate lighting in the park itself, uh, but some sort of um, meaningful traffic control would probably have to be toward that intersection. It's, it's going to be a nightmare. Yes. You, you yeah, got what is it, Northchester and Hollister and uh, Princess Anne Road and going east and west. That, that could yes. probably be uh, kind of an ugly intersection for people trying to go across the street there. 
Yeah. So keep that in mind as you go forward. Uh, any other questions, uh, Mr. Whitney, Commissioners? I've got a yes. question. Hold, hold on. I'll go on, Kevin. I'll go after you. All right. Go ahead, Kevin. Thank you. Um, are they only looking at Princess Anne Road or are they looking at Virginia Beach Boulevard also? Because I would say that east to west, Virginia Beach Boulevard is even worse than Princess Anne between um, Park and uh, Ballantyne. Um, so they're they're looking and I'm looking at some of their study maps and, and, and materials from their meetings. And yeah, it, it's just Princess Anne Road, it looks like um, from Church Street to Ballantyne. So, um, but yes, you're right. There's a lot of similarities between the two as far as uh, traffic and safety issues go. But uh, just looking at their materials, it, yeah, it looks like they're just looking at Princess Anne Road. Um, That's something we can uh, look at for sure, yeah. I'd ask the question that, um, if you don't mind, at least Princess Anne has a light at uh, Majestic. There's nothing be between Ballantyne and Park on, on Virginia Beach Boulevard. Um, it is very, very dangerous for pedestrians. It's a good point, Kevin. That was on Majestic, you said, yeah. Dr. Austin? Yeah, an observation, uh, Chris, it, it appears that you you were thinking about the interpenetration of industrial into residential areas as you uh, were redrawing uh, this zoning plan, reworking the zoning plan. Um, and, you know, addressing the article that Earl had us read, that's an important issue, especially for certain neighborhoods. Were, um, did you, what did you do in relationship to that? I don't, I can't see the map, but it seems to me that you were conscious of that. Yeah, absolutely. The industrial up there uh, in Bruce's Park, yes. Um, you know, the, the actual plan, so in the 2004 plan, there was actually some um, calls or recommendations for aggressive efforts to assemble parcels for development and sort of, you know, really, it, t it talked a lot about, you know, creating a master plan for Bruce's Park. And a lot of it was things like, you know, do we create a pattern book? Um, and, you know, for, for new, new single family homes and making sure they're in character, much like we've done in old Huntersville. Um, and, you know, just really trying to make sure things were compatible uh, with the architecture in the area. Um, and then, so, through time, though, and, and, and really more recently, we when we looked at the some of the uses, the land uses, and the zoning districts in the area, um, yeah, this industrial uh, area w was a big part of that. And, and, rec and you know, we know um, just from you know our own experiences and and uh, you know knowledge that there are a lot of you know uses out there that if and they're scattered. Um, you know, they're scattered around like commercial, industrial, whatever, what have you. Uh, and there's no, there are no nodes of it. That that tends to be a problem. Um, and in this case, you have, um, you know, not so much the, the industrial isn't so much scattered, but it is, um, it is tucked away in a neighborhood, uh, and, you know, historically may have, you know, it served a purpose historically, uh, of course, with the railroad being there. Um, but when you look at when you start to look at the the network, the road network, the neighborhood uh, road network, you begin to see how it really inconducive it, it can be for for large truck traffic and things of that nature. Um, and so, you know, and, and given that, and, and the feedback that we've heard from the community and other um, other efforts in the past, like I mentioned with these planning efforts, you know, I, I think a part of that, a big part of that, is is looking at at rezonings and uh, in future land use map amendments um, to really uh, kind of a that's the best way we think to address it and, and to really put put some some legs on on some of those comments that have happened in the past and um, I, we just you know given the location of it in the neighborhood you know it's just it's just not very conducive we think to uh, to lots of industrial truck traffic and things like that so that's really that's kind of you know, of, of the context to it and some of the history to it. Um, we, we've been made aware that there are health issues also associated with this. 
um, because of because of industrial waste and so forth and so on. Uh, has there been any thinking on that or or researching that? Um, not at this point. Um, we haven't we haven't like uh, dived into that that aspect specifically yet. But that's certainly you know that that is uh, very much a part of what we're going to look at it and and what we we you know this planning effort is, is going to cover is is you know not just you know it's it's comprehensive. It's it's uh, you know is the what are the current uses there? Um, what what's around there? Um, what what's sort of the historic pattern in the area? And also public health, uh, transportation. You know, we're going to absolutely look at all these things. And yes, industrial. You know, especially a large site um, that's had industrial on it. Uh, you know, fairly heavy, heavier industrial, is is always. You know, it's it's always an issue with with having neighborhoods right right uh, adjacent to it. So, you know, there's. I think this is. It's sort of a almost also a way of connecting what what's been going on with the Broad Creek Renaissance, which you know began around 2005 to the east and then the north, um, and kind of trying to sort of stretch that that effort and that that um, you know all, that success over to the west. Um, so and this may be uh, hopefully will be a first step in that um, and, and try to you know try to try to fix some of these these land use conflicts we think. Thank you, Chris. Any uh, other questions of Mr. Whitney? I'm sorry, Dr. Olson, you have another question? Oh, uh, I was just thinking of what Kevin was, uh, what uh, uh, Nikita was saying uh, about uh, roads and uh, the coming together of many lanes of traffic, which has been uh, really a tool in certain area development uh, by cities and federal, state, and local government. Um, uh, and going forward in the future, uh, are you also looking at that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and 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 I'll also mention that you know don't want to uh, you know forget to mention this as well. But we we're looking at you know the city has a vision zero um, policy or goal really of creating safe and healthy streets, and you know it's. The existing industrial uses are, you know, by being incompatible with that predominantly residential area and the character of the area, um, you know, then the streets there have a lot of on-street parking and, and things like that, that that you know really serve the neighborhood. Um, you know, it's it's there's a lot of in the Jay Cox Elementary School as well. There's a lot of you know, it's truly a, a community there uh, that 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 um, you know is very walkable and, and having children, you know. Young, very young children at the elementary school walking in the neighborhood and nearby, you know, trying to reduce these conflicts, these pedestrian fatalities and injuries and things like that. Um, we think that, you know, trying to address this and make some of that, the industrial zoning out of there would, would be a huge step in, in, in hopefully accomplishing that, that overall city goal of uh, Vision Zero. Um, so that's another part of it. Um, and, and again, that, that of course applies to Princess Anne Road. And, and Virginia Beach Boulevard in the study area. Um, and so we're really trying to trying to mesh all of those different things, concepts and policies together um, as we, you know, as we as we come together with this refresh plan um, that that really reflects what's there. It's sort of the updated vision um, and also a recognition of what's there um, and some of the conditions, whether it's the road or the um, private developments on sites. Um, so hopefully that helps that answer your question, but um, let me know if I can, you know, expound on anything. Well, thank you for now, Chris. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, Chris, uh, uh, any other questions, uh, Mr. Whitney, commissioners? Chris, needless to say, this uh, uh, Broad Creek Renaissance and, and adjacent and adjoining communities criti critical to the vibrancy of the city going forward. So I, I want to applaud you for at, at least keeping an eye, a, a crow's eye view of just uh, what's taking place there and a finger on the pulse of the future. Of course, we're going to be involved in that too, I'm sure. Uh, but you, you're the first line of defense to make sure that we are able to 
follow this thing through sufficiently from a planning perspective to make sure that uh, another smelting plant doesn't end up in somebody's backyard. Uh, and, and those things are, are, are vital to the ongoing, what I call success of the Broad Creek Renaissance. Um, I'm delighted that we've seen that we have expanded that, including the adjacent neighborhoods. Um, any other questions or comments at this point, commissioners? Hearing none, Susan. Okay, so two motions on this one. The motion is to recommend the, the approval of the amendments to the future land use map within the city's general plan, Plan Norfolk 2030. Ms. Austin? Yes. Mr. Houchins? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Ms. Shelton? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Aye. Mr. Hales? Aye. And Mr. Fraley? Aye. Okay, the second one, uh, the motion is to recommend approval of the changes of zoning. Ms. Austin? Yes. Mr. Houchins? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Ms. Shelton? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Aye. Mr. Hales? Aye. And Mr. Fraley? I will make those recommendations to council. Moving on to item number five, Susan. Okay, and I'm gonna do the same thing here. I'm gonna read five and four together, same uh, presentation, but we'll do two different motions at the end. So number five, pathway realty group for a change of zoning from RC residential coastal and CC community commercial to conditional CC community commercial at 7911 through 7915 Shore Drive and 7920 through 7930 Ransom Road and number six, the Pathway Realty Group LLC for the following conditional use permits at 7911 through 7915 Shore Drive and 7920 through 7930 Ransom Road. A, to allow more than 24 dwelling units and B, to allow less than 50% of the first floor commercial. Okay, so this site is located um, in Ocean View Avenue, just south of the intersection of Little Creek Road and Shore Drive. You've got the 7-Eleven that's right on the corner. This is kind of behind that uh, slide. So the, the two parcels that you see uh, on the uh, kind of on the south, uh, uh, the, the bottom portion of the slide that are highlighted in black, as you can see, they're actually dual zoned. The front portion of the parcel parcels uh, is actually zoned commercial and the rear with no property line uh, is zoned um, uh, residential coastal. So to accommodate what the applicant is proposing, which is to do a mixed use uh, project, uh, we're bringing the whole thing uh, into a conditional CC, which is community commercial district. So again, the applicant is proposing to construct a mixed use development uh, and they are proposing um, residential, a residential structure to the rear, and then a commercial structure uh, in front. Slide, please. So this is the proposed site plan. Uh, as you can see, you've got the uh, commercial component, the commercial pad up front along Shore Drive with one access from Shore Drive. And then to the rear of that, you've got the uh, residential building uh, with uh, another access from Ransom Road. Um, the applicant uh, did meet with uh, the East Ocean View Civic League, I think on a couple occasions. Uh, and uh, I did attend, I think it was the second one uh, and had uh, significant support from the community. Um, at our last year mid-month meeting, uh, we had uh, a good discussion uh, and you all expressed a great deal of concern about um, multiple projects that were occurring in the Ocean View area uh, that were indicating they were gonna do kind of a mix, uh, both uh, commercial and residential. Um, we heard you, we heard your concern that what we were getting was the residential component of it, but we were not getting the commercial component. So we worked and we crafted what we thought was a fairly good um, condition that would have required that the uh, commercial be built and to the shell stage before the uh, residential could be finaled. However, when we shared that with our attorney's office, they indicated that the contract that has already been um, approved by council um, would be, uh, it would directly conflict with that uh, condition. Uh, in the contract, apparently there is a certain amount of time which they have to start and finish the residential 
and then it gives them another period, I think it's a year, um, to start on the commercial. So unfortunately, um, that was not a condition we were able to include um, in this recommend recommendation. Um, so that being said, um, staff is recommending that the um, applications be approved and I'm gonna read um, the change of zoning. So on this one, the applicant did proffer a condition uh, and that proffer is the site, the site shall be developed in accordance with the conceptual master site plan dated August 13, 2019 and prepared by land planning solutions subject to changes required during the site plan review process. So that's the site plan that we're looking at now. It does require them to do that commercial um, on the front. If they don't do it, they would have to come back and uh, amend the condition in this rezoning. And then for the conditional uh, use permit, so again, they have to do one for uh, less than 50% of the bottom floor for commercial and then more than um, 24 units. So the conditions there um, are any improvements to the site shall be reviewed and approved through the design and review process. So this is city property, so it will, will be required to go through that process. Uh, and that will come to both the architectural review board and you all, the city planning commission. Um, I do also want to note a change in this one. Initially, when we were working with the applicant, um, he indicated he was going to do 90 units. Um, he is now proposing to do uh, no more than 100. Obviously, if when he goes through site plan and he can't, cannot accommodate everything that he needs to accommodate on that site plan, uh, the landscaping, the um, resilient quotient, the stormwater, um, he will have to have all of the parking that is required for that number of units. Uh, and then C, prior to the issuance of the final certificate of occupancy for the residential structure, the perimeter of the commercial site will be landscaped in accordance with section 5.3, landscaping standards of the Norfolk Zoning Ordinance. So if we don't get the commercial right away, we will get the required landscaping along Shore Drive and along the perimeter of that um, commercial pad. So with those conditions, staff is recommending that these applications be approved. Thank you, Susan. How many stories is that residential building? So it's four above parking. Okay. And are we parking underneath on the ground? Right. So the rear of the building is actually in a flood zone. So they're going to have to bring it up. So did I understand then that council has negotiated the sale and did some planning at the same time? So it, yeah, there were things in the contract that uh, we, we best not, I guess, uh, write conditions that would conflict with it. Well, you know, that goes, goes right to the heart of what brought us to have some reservations about these types of plans in Ocean View to begin with. But uh, that water, that die has been cast. Um, I got one last question. Um, the item immediately adjacent, if you look at the screen, uh, right over top of the commercial area, that's not a part of this. I might understand. It's just another. No, so they property. were, that's considering tax. They were trying to get that property um, and uh, at this time have been unable to. If they do, um, they'd have to bring that into um, this rezoning. So right now, the, the, connection between uh, X amount of occupancy of the dwelling units, then you have to start the commercial that's out. All right. From what I understand, uh, Mr. Chair, they have to start commercial 12 months at least, or no more than 12 months after they finish the residential. Um, I also, I also know that I think there's discussions between those, I guess there's, there's a 7-Eleven there, there's a tax place, right. that you, there, there's, there's discussion with all the properties there to try to expand this and bring it all together into one big thing. I'm, I'm assured that the, uh, the commercial pad will be developed as a commercial pad at some point um, in the future and will, will not be apartment, more apartments. All right. Well, Matt, if you're comfortable with that, I'm comfortable because you know you took the lead on bringing that to our attention. Yeah, no, I've been on the phone for the past three days on it, trying to yeah. make sure that, that we're all on the same page. I think I'm on the same. <laughs> I hear you. Any other question or comment, commissioners? Anyone here to speak for or against either of these two applications? Susan? There is. Uh, Trevor is here as well as. Um, oh, go ahead. Maybe he doesn't want to say anything. Oh, I'm sorry, Susan, here. Trevor Spears, 1776 Laskin Road, Virginia Beach. I just want to, again, thank you guys, the city. 
um, city council and planning planning departments always does a fantastic job working with us. Um, and just to let you know, uh, to what Mr. Hale said, we have every intention of developing that commercial lot as quickly as possible. That corner right there, uh, the corner of Little Creek and Shore Drive is one of the busiest corners in uh, the city of Norfolk. So it, it, uh, it behooves us to get that developed as soon as possible. Thank you, sir. Any questions of the applicant commissioners? Is there anyone uh, with us that is against his application? Susan. Okay. So again, two two uh, motions. The first, the motion is to recommend approval of the change of zoning uh, subject to the proper condition tying the rezoning to the site plan. Ms. Austin? Yes. Mr. Houchins? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Ms. Shelton? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Aye. Mr. Hales? Aye. And Mr. Fraley? Aye. We'll make that recommendation to council. Good luck. Item number okay. seven, Susan. Thank you. Uh, six. So then the second one is the motion is to recommend the approval. Six. I'm sorry. The conditional use permit subject to the conditions contained in the draft ordinance, including the modification um changing the minimum uh the maximum number of units from 90 to 100. Uh, miss austin yes mr houchins aye miss Mur mr murphy aye miss shelton yes miss lloyd aye mr hales aye and mr fraley aye we'll make that recommendation to council as well good luck Okay. Now we have seven, Fort Tar Lock for a conditional use permit to operate short-term rental units at 1001 Monticello Avenue. The purpose of the request is to allow each unit of the existing building to operate as short-term rental units. Yes, thank you, Susan. So the applicant, Mr. Glenn, owns the building known as Fort Tar Lots, which is located at the three-way juncture of 11th Street, Monticello Avenue, and Fort Tar Lane. Uh, the building was built in 1916 as an automobile, automobile showroom and is a contributing structure of the Norfolk Auto Road Historic District, which is a state and national district, but not a local district. Uh, it's now a mixed use building uh, with 3000 square feet of commercial space on the ground floor and 13 one bedroom apartments on the second floor. Um, Mr. Glenn would like to be able to would now like to be able to market his apartments as vacation rental uh, because the apartment complex has uh, over 10 apartments. Uh, he is, needs a conditional use permit to do so. At this time, Mr. Glenn is requesting the conditional use permit for just two of the building's uh, units. So if approved, the total number of overnight guests will be limited to four, two to each uh, apartment. Uh, next slide, please. So as you can see from the slide, the subject property is zone G1, Granby Monticello, Monticello Corridor Mixed Use. And surround, it is surrounded, uh, uh, the property is surrounded by a mix of office and commercial, uh, uh, also zone G1. And across Monticello uh, Avenue is the city-owned parking lot. Um, the, the applicant did meet up with the Downtown Civic League on May 18th, and the Civic League did not oppose uh, the application. Their words, not mine. <laughs> um, vacation rentals do not conflict with the city's comprehensive plan for the Downtown District. It describes it as a place designed to grow into a high-intensity blend of residential, retail, service, hotels, office, industrial, and civic uses, all supporting a pedestrian-oriented environment. Uh, Fort Tar Lofts does have adequate parking to accommodate both its current use and proposed use. The parking is located on the bottom floor. Uh, they do have an in indoor garage. Um, next slide, please. And there you can see where the uh, garage entry place is. Uh, since the building, as most older buildings in Norfolk do, occupies the entire lot, there is little opportunity for landscape improvement on the site. However, there is a patch of unfinished surface above the utility door that you see before you. Mm -hmm. uh, it's places Fort Tar Lane. Uh, the applicant has agreed to repair it as a condition of, of approval. So that uh, 
Uh, staff does recommend uh, approval with standard conditions. That concludes my report. If there are any questions. Joy, where is the commercial portion of this building? Uh, yeah, it's, it has it's, some commercial there. Yeah, it's it's it, hard to find. It's tucked away. Um, if you it, it the the entry for the commercial space faces Fort Tar Lane. Uh, if you look at the utility door that you see before you, there's a similar utility door not too far from that door. Looks very similar to that, and it, it's not like retail space it's more and i hopefully the applicant is here he can talk more about it it's more i think more office space than anything and the area uh, that we're looking at at the end of that utility door that needs to be uh made to look better what is it yeah the applicant mr glenn agrees that it needs to be repaired he, it's just been he as he expressed to me it's just been a low on his priority list mm -hmm. But you don't know what he's planning to do there. Uh, it, it would have to be a condition of, a, of before he can uh, offer the apartments as short-term rental. Okay. Well, I guess what I'm saying, what kind of service? Is he going to put concrete there? Is he going to uh, uh, make that grass or what? Uh, hopefully the applicant is, can chime in and ask okay. for that himself, sir. Okay. But no, I do not know. Earl, what she's talking about is on the building, not on the ground. Correct. Okay, I'm look. Oh, okay. Well, I'm looking at what's coming out of the door. At yeah, it's above the door. Okay. It's above. It's the black space above the door on the slide to the right. I'm looking at the wrong thing. But my yeah, concern was to the right. My concern was to the left. If you, you got a mixture of gravel and concrete there, am I looking at that correctly? That oh, yeah. That's, no, that's pub. That's public right away. Most of that's public right okay. away. Okay, good deal. So we need to do something. All right. Any Thank questions? You what you're uh, is anyone, the applicant here, or anyone here to speak for or against this application? Mr. Chairman, I've got a question if the applicant's not on the line. Uh, I guess I direct it to Joy. Do we know if uh, the current residents have been informed of this application? Uh, I did drop, uh, I did insert uh, notifications in their mailboxes. And I did notice just to, I did see Mr. Glenn made a note. He can't get connected at this time. I guess he's having some technical difficulties. Uh, I'm not, I guess I could try chatting with him. We can see the chat, Joy, if, oh, I mean, can. if okay. Kevin wants to, if Kevin, if you want to ask, I mean, I don't know if that's against the rules, but if Kevin wants to ask the question, he can hear us. It looks like he just can't, he can't speak back to us. And just to be clear, he is only talking about two of the units in this building, and he has specifically designated which units. It's pretty clear. And it will stay that way going forward. Those two units will be the only two. Correct. Uh, the, conditional use, yeah. the conditional use permit will expire in two years, right. um, like like all uh, short-term rental conditional mm -hmm. use permits. Um, mm -hmm. At that point, he may choose to request more or less. I don't know. Uh, but he's identified his, his apartments or units. One and yes, two. Yes, yes. And they yeah. are included in your staff report. They're unit, I believe they're unit one and unit 10, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. Uh, and going back to Kevin's question, uh, you did say that you personally notified each of the tenants. I didn't. I didn't. I slipped um, our our the notification that we sent out to uh, area uh, property owners. I personally slipped it into the uh, mailboxes. Whether right. they received it or not, I can't say. Good. Have you got any feedback from? Them? I have not. Uh, any other questions, commissions, comments? Oh, I see Mr. Glenn says the tenants are aware that the units uh, faded away. Okay. Uh, I the the tenants are aware of the units in the building. Okay. Yeah, and I can see on my chat, this is Kathy, I can see on my chat where he's saying the repairs above the door will match the surrounding area, yeah. if that makes sense. It's still uh, up on mine for some reason. I can see it. 
Yeah, I can see it too. Well, you might let them know that uh, uh, the utility toilet that we're looking at on the left, right outside, that doesn't look good. But Joy has made it clear that's our responsibility. And we'll see what we can do to help enhance that area a little bit. All right, have, sir. <laughs> uh, we have any other comment or question at this point? If either of you is talking to, or talking to Mr. Glenn, if he's got anything to say, if you could pass it on. Uh, the last thing he said was at 509, the tenants are aware of the units in the building. So I don't know if you can see the chat feature on the bottom right corner of your screen, Earl, but that's where it's, this is where it's coming up for me. If you, if you condense the participant box, the chat box will expand and you'll see all the chatter. Yes. Yes. I got so, it. Dear. Thank you. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Any other questions, commissioners? Susan. Okay. The motion is to recommend approval of the conditional use permit subject to the conditions contained in the draft ordinance. Ms. Austin? Yes. Mr. Houchins? Aye. Mr. Murphy? Aye. Ms. Shelton? Yes. Ms. Lloyd? Aye. Mr. Hales? Aye. And Mr. Fraley? Aye. I will make that recommendation to council. Good luck with that. Okay, item number eight is a request by Poppy Angel LLC for a conditional use permit to operate an automobile storage lot at 5570 Raby Road. But the purpose of the request is to allow the operation of an automobile storage lot. So as you can see, um, this lot is located on the uh, northeast corner of Raby Road and Saber Road. If you follow um, Ravy to or Saber, excuse me, to the south, you hit Virginia Beach Boulevard. If you follow it kind of up to the north, it turns into Lowry and then it hits North Military Highway. Military and East Virginia Beach are very commercial, but this area in here is really solidly industrial. Um, there are multiple car related and auto related uses within this area. Slide. So again, and this particular site is zoned IL, which is industrial light. And the applicant proposes to use the vacant lot as an automobile storage lot. Um, in the IL district to do a storage lot, um, a conditional use permit is required. Slide. So this is an old survey of the property. Um, it, it looks like there are still buildings there. However, all of the buildings on the site have been removed and the um, old foundations are still there. Um, the applicant, because we require it when you have a business on a site, you have to have a structure. So the building kind of up against the property line on the right hand side of the slide would be the, the uh, structure that would be proposed to be built for the business. Um, next slide. So these are pictures that I went to the site and I took um, two weeks ago, just before our mid-month meeting. Um, as you can see, like I mentioned, it is a, a vacant site. Um, there, I mentioned there are um, foundations of the old buildings. It looks like the buildings were um, taken down between 2016 and 2017. Um, but as I mentioned, the foundations uh, remained in place. Uh, another slide, please. And then this is just uh, from different angles, same uh, same uh, location. So um, staff is recommending that this application be approved. Um, as, I as I had mentioned, um, this area is, is pretty solidly industrial and there are many other, including a city owned uh, parcel that has uh, automobile related facilities. Um, it is being approved subject to the following conditions. So again, when we do a conditional use permit, um, we look at the site and we um, make some recommendations as to what improvements should be made depending on the use. And again, I'm not gonna read all the conditions, I wanna hit the highlights though. Um, so uh, a new driveway apron shall be installed along the Sabre Road right away. That was a comment from um, Transit. 
Um, landscaping shall be installed uh, in accordance with the landscaping plan attached here too and marked as exhibit B, subject to any revisions required to be made during the site plan review. All areas of the site used for vehicle parking of any kind shall consist of asphalt, concrete, brick or stone pavers, or other improved hard surface treatments and shall not include gravel, dirt, or sand. Um, so we had indicated to the applicant that um, if they just wanted to use the concrete pads, the old pads from the buildings, um, that would be fine. However, they have indicated they want to use the entire site. Um, if we require it to be improved, that will definitely kick them into site plan. So through site plan, they would have to do the improvements to stormwater, the landscaping and all of that. So that's why we indicate uh, as uh, required through uh, site plan. And then um, if a solid waste receptacle is situated on the site, it shall conform with all of the requirements of section 5.4.4A of the Norfolk Zoning Ordinance. Uh, refuse containers, which include opaque masonry walls, uh, are needed for accessibility for trash removal, a minimum of six feet in height, and designed to be compatible with the principal building. So we want them to have somewhere to throw their trash. Um, there shall be no razor wire permitted on the site, and any existing razor wire shall be removed. And then the last one, and working with the applicant, they have indicated that this is a temporary use. So generally when we talk temporary, we're talking a few months. But in this instance, we said, okay, fine. Um, the conditional use, use permit shall expire two years after approved by city council. So we gave them two years to operate because they indicated this was only a temporary um, use. Um, they held their own meeting um, and um, didn't get a whole lot of attendance. We did get a letter from Interstate Battery, which is kind of directly across the street from them. It was really a letter of concern uh, about the condition of the site uh, over the past few years uh, and their concern about the storage of, uh, of wrecked or inoperative vehicles on the site. And with that, I'll stand by for questions. Thank you, Susan. Any questions for Susan, commissioners? Yeah, my, my first reaction to this is that it's somewhat confusing as to why they would go through all of that for uh, for a temporary uh, uh, solution for what they want to do, um, uh, it, I'm 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 somewhat surprised by it. But I think Miss Murphy is probably still with us. She's the representing the applicant. She can give us some feedback on that, Doctor Austin. Thank you. Any other questions, commissioners? Thank you, Susan. Uh, is anyone here to speak in favor of this application? Ms. Murphy, are you still with us? I am. Can you see and hear me? I hear you fine. Great. Okay. Huh. Hopefully you'll be able to continue to hear me fine. Um, good afternoon. Thank you all for the opportunity. Um, I, I guess I'll go ahead and, and answer Ms. Uh, Dr. Austin's question first. And the, the answer is our, our client uh, owns a uh, facility about 600 feet away, that's an administrative building on 1132 Harmony Road. And then across from that street is a quality self, uh, AOK -okay mini storage facility. And so when they acquired this lot, their thought was that they could um, have this essentially as an accessory use to the, the self storage. So if a service member wanted to, to put his car someplace for six months until he came back from deployment, uh, or if somebody had an, a recreational vehicle or some work equipment that they used that they needed uh, to store somewhere, that they could do that, again, in conjunction with their, uh, their self-storage use. Uh, obviously, it's not on the lot. It can't be an accessory use. Um, if you go back in your packet, page 277 in your packet, uh, and it was the first part of the first slide, I think, that Sherry showed, um, you can see even from the aerial of this property that um, for a long um, while and including when the satellite photo was taken, um, there were recreational vehicles and other vehicles stored on the property. Yep, yeah, go back one. I don't know if you can zoom. It, it's, there's a better picture in your packet, again, at page 277. But the property was until recently after the buildings were removed, it was uh, used for recreational vehicle storage, other types of vehicle storage. 
and as was was mentioned all around this property, you've got light industrial uses, including other gravel, uh, automobile, and RV storage lots. So our our client back in the fall thought, okay, well, you know, this would be a good accessory use. We've got the office facility. We can have our renters meet us at the office. We can take them over to this property, unlock the gate, let them park their vehicle or whatever. This is not a junkyard. It's not inoperable equipment, which I think uh, the gentleman from uh, Interstate Battery was concerned about. This is going to be cars, RVs, uh, vehicles, equipment, that type of thing. Um, and so when our client talked to staff back in the fall, they were told that this would fall under the vehicle sales and service use category, although obviously they're not servicing these vehicles. Um, and that includes a range of uses. So they were told they needed a conditional use permit. Um, as Susan indicated, they met with staff on multiple occasions, uh, landscape architect, they attended a transportation meeting, they held their own community meeting because there is no civic league. Uh, they attended a site plan meeting. And through the course of all that, they ended up with the site plan that you see. And as Susan mentioned, the buildings that are along the, um, it should be the northern and eastern property line, uh, but it looks like, the, I'm not sure about the north arrow. Those buildings are gone and all that's left is the concrete pad. So that's the concrete area that you can see on page 277 is in your packet is where sort of that L shape of uh, RVs uh, is, is currently being parked. Um, so they, you know, again, their, their goal was to temporarily use this fence lot to be able to have a place for their customers to store cars, RVs, trucks, trailers, and equipment. Um, in November, they were told that in addition to the changes that they already made, the surface would have to be improved. Uh, and then through a series of conversations uh, at the end of December, they were told um, that the lot, that improved surface meant that it would have to be paved. There was, um, it was not clear in the ordinance, which is uh, why we got involved ultimately and why it went to the BZA. The BZA agreed that the, the language of the ordinance was not clear and it didn't, uh, improved surface did not necessarily mean a paved surface. And that there were, uh, as I mentioned, the, the um, public works director could determine whether an improved surface was, uh, was suffic a sufficient surface. In any event, that um, appeal, we won. The, the text amendment that you heard was brought. Um, and that all came out of a, a January call that I had with Jeremy Sharp. Um, and I think it was Chris Whitney where they said, you know, we've made this policy determination that every surface has to be paved. They directed me to that. And then we, we went through that BZA process. So. Um, our client is a small business owner uh, in Norfolk. They have been for some time now. This is an additional use in addition to their, uh, their self storage use. To get to the question of temporary. So, you know, I was trying, as I always do, I tried to find a compromise between what our client intended for the property and what, what staff wanted for more of a permanent use. And so my suggestion to Adam was that we would offer the temporary time period um, for the use of the gravel lot with the, we would do the landscaping, um, they would do the apron improvements on Sabre Road, they would add the, the, the hut, but those things wouldn't necessarily require full on site plan review and full um, paving and stormwater management and hundreds of thousands of dollars of improvements. So we said, look, if we keep this as a temporary use, you know, we can put in tens of thousands of dollars of improvements in landscaping, make it look nice. Uh, they had gotten a quote to replace the gravel, take away the mud and debris, fix the surface that's there now so it doesn't look the way it looks now with the, uh, with the mud and the holes. And then if they wanted to go past a certain period, as far as the temporary use, then they would be required to go full on site plan. And that way, you know, if they decided in in five years they wanted to to build a whole mini storage lot there, they wouldn't have to remove all of the improvements that they just had spent a ton of money um, adding to the property. So to answer your question, the short term piece of it was offered as a compromise, but only in exchange for the right 
to be able to to essentially not have to pave the entire surface immediately. Um, and again, you know, if 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 they're going to have to go through a major site plan review, if they're going to have to pave the whole thing, then certainly there shouldn't be a limit on the time period, uh, given the amount of improvements and expense they put into it. So your sense was right. It doesn't make sense to limit the time period unless there's a reason to do that. In our mind, the only reason to do that is if they're able to, for a short, ter short term, just operate essentially on the gravel and concrete that's there now with some limited improvements. Um, the other thing that, um, so it's temporary in the in the sense that they, there's no other way to say it, you don't wanna put a ton of money into something that you're gonna go ahead and redevelop in a few years. And, and so that was the balance that we were trying to strike and that what we had offered up. Um, obviously there's a, you know, a, a few, few zeros, a uh, significant difference between landscaping and some minor improvements and the major improvements that would otherwise be required. I want to point out, and it, it's in the staff report, I thought that I would highlight, you know, Raby Road, which runs along the eastern side of this, basically on the side across from where um, the school division parks their uh, uh, school buses, is scheduled for ma uh, major stormwater improvements. So they're basically gonna have Raby Road torn up. Uh, I think this says it's supposed to start in the fall of 2020. Who knows if given the uh, current economic crisis, if that's gonna happen. But Raby Road's gonna be torn up for a time anyway. And again, you know, in our mind, even more reason not to have to go ahead and pay the entirety of the site. Um, we had also, um, we're surprised to see the condition about the barbed wire coming down. Obviously, in any um, area where you have storage and sort of minimal um, employee presence, there's the concern for security and safety. And so I, it's not clear to me why the um, existing barbed wire would need to come down, especially given that it really is a, a security feature for the you know, vehicles, trailers, RVs, and equipment that would be stored on the lot. So we had questioned um, that condition as well. Um, you know, we were happy that staff is recommending approval, but again, did have some concerns about the conditions and their, you know, the conditions, as you know, are meant to mitigate any uh, issues caused by the use. In this case, you've got light industrial all around it. Um, the landscaping that'll be added will make it look nicer. The apron will make it look nicer. You'll, you'll have a hut on there. So it, you know, some of the, some of the other um, conditions really didn't seem to be uh, related to items that would be necessary to mitigate the use. Um, on the issue of the oil and water separator and environmental, um, the sort of general performance standards for sales and service, automobile sales and service uses, which this is, really are, are meant to address active uses where you're actually changing the oil and, and doing things on the property. As I mentioned, there won't be inoperable vehicles. This won't be a junkyard. It will just be like any other um, uh, type of longer term sort of parking lot for lack of a better way to put that. So uh, again, we, would request that you recommend approval um, to the extent that you're going to include a condition on the time period. We would like that to be linked to gravel only usage uh, with a, sort of a grandfather period so that in the, in the future, if they do want this to be more permanent, they would go through major site plan and all the requirements that would be involved in paving and improving that site. Otherwise, um, they you know, will likely have future plans and they don't want to have to tear out everything in a couple of years that they've spent a lot of money to put in. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Hopefully uh, that answered the one question that, that came up. So Ms. Murphy, it seems like you want to store vehicles there for a short period of time and just want to do, don't want to do a lot of work to beautify the site. Is, is that pretty much it? Well, I think beautify the site, yes, because there's the, all the landscaping that was shown on the site plan um, and, and the improvements to that driveway apron on Sabre and ultimately the improvements to the driveway apron on Raby. 
Uh, but yeah, they, they didn't want to go through full, full blown site plan for a site that. I mean, let's face it, they want to park cars and vehicles and RVs there now. Uh, so they've got some money to pay the taxes, right? Um, if they make all the improvements, it would be for a long term use and they don't see this really as a long term use at this point. What plans other than stories does your client have for that site? Um, they don't know. I mean, it'll, it would be market driven. Um, the potential is to maybe do an additional um, self storage facility, like the one they had that that a okay uh, mini storage just down the street. Um, but there are any any one of a number of uses that you know they may may be able to make of that property. But it is. I don't, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say it is light industrial, and this is probably one of the lowest impact possible light industrial uses for this particular property. Are they storing any vehicles of that type now at some other facility or location? No, this this lot's empty. The clients on the line, she can maybe talk to that, but not at this location or at um, the A quality self storage. But I know Angelique is on the line and she can um, address the you know future plans or the other places where they have storage. Thank you. Any other question or comment, commissioners? Yeah, the, uh, the issue of the gravel, how does that fit in with um, the resiliency plan? It would be for two and, and a, two and a half years before it comes up again. Uh, and thinking of the area in which this will be located, um, does water mitigation tr trump the kind of uh, ground cover that is there. Ms. Murphy? I, I'm not sure I understand the question. So are you saying does the um, semi-pervious nature of the gravel serve uh, to, to manage the stormwater? Or are you saying how, how it, would it be developed in the future? No, uh, the, 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 the present management, the need to manage stormwater, uh, how does this site figure into that? And, and can uh, the city uh, afford two and a half years with that surface uh, when um, it may be necessary to move as many surfaces as quickly as possible into uh, the plan for resiliency by helping to uh, uh, carry uh, stormwater. So for the the short term, if if we were able to proceed with the landscaping improvements and the improvements that you see on the site plan, the impervious cover would be below, or the disturbed area would be below that twenty five hundred square feet. So it wouldn't trigger the stormwater requirements, number one, but number two, it wouldn't add to the impervious cover of that property. So it's no more impervious cover than what's there now and you've got those concrete pads. Thank you. Any other questions, commissioners? Comment? Go ahead. Ready? I thought somebody was trying to say something. Let me ask the question to be clear. Right now, Susan, the application would expire in two years the way it is currently submitted. Is that correct? Correct. Not the application, but the conditional use permit. Conditional use permit. Right. And what is staff What's recommendation? That? Now, if that's something you wanted to remove based on the fact that they were going to do all of the improvements that we've requested, um, I'll be honest, our concern was if if the improvements got taken out at council, then that two year clock isn't gonna be in there. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I personally, I like the application like it is. Well, and can council still take out the two years if they want to? Absolutely. Right, Susan? So. Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, 
So what we're looking at now is the uh, improvements around the perimeter, uh, the two driveway aprons, uh, and pretty much what we got there in terms of the storage area itself will remain as is for at least two years. Is that correct, Susan? No, our recommendation is that it, the site has to be all areas of the site used for vehicle parking of any kind shall consist of asphalt, concrete, brick okay. or stone pavers, and other improved hard surfaces. So our recommendation is essentially that because the applicant does want to use the whole site, that's going to kick her into site plan. So that's what our recommendation is. Right. And, and, and they're saying they did not want to go that far until they get a better sense as to whether or not this is an endeavor they will want to pursue on a full-scale basis. I believe so. Yeah. yeah. Can I, I'm the applicant, am I, can I speak for a second, please? Absolutely. Okay, my name is Angelique Graglin, address 5191 Cypress Point Circle, Virginia Beach, Virginia, 23455. Um, it's not, it was never my intention to permanently use this site as a storage, an outdoor storage facility. Um, I do, however, you know, am trying to conserve some money and use it for more than just automobiles. I mean, equipment, other things, which is why I say, no, I would like to use the whole site. I don't say I want to put automobiles on the entire site, but according to even what Jeremy was saying earlier at the beginning of the meeting, that equipment does not require an improved surface. And then we go down the rabbit hole of what what is really improved and the standards that you're trying to, to change. But technically the crush and run, the way it is down there now is a semi-improved surface. And my intention is to generate some income so that I can save some money to eventually develop this lot one day. I don't want to pave the whole thing when I'm not exactly sure where I'm going to stick a building on it one day. Mm -hmm. um, yes, what, what uh, it, it appears, however, that timelines here are loose, elastic because we are now talking about uh, two years uh, review and so forth and so on, but that seems to be uh, questionable. So this could extend out as long as, 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 as if we don't know uh, without anything uh, being done uh, to uh, the entire surface of the, of the property over time. There are some two, there are unknowns here that make this somewhat um, somewhat not certain as to what's actually happening. Yeah, the only thing I would say is you do not need a two-year time limit if you keep the condition that requires the applicant to pave the entire area and go through major review. The only reason any type of a time limit is if you allow